This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Three minutes after ten is the time. A very good morning to you. It is an odd news agenda at the moment. There's a lot of stuff about to happen that hasn't actually happened. The most serious of which would be a potential cessation of hostilities in Gaza, although that would be temporary. The autumn budget statement, whatever you call it, statement budget statement, autumn budget statement autumn, is due to unfold on Wednesday. Uh, but of course, there is a lot of speculation surrounding what is likely to be in it. Um, and there are some legal cases being brought against rugby and massive tech companies. I, I'm interested in both of those. I like the look of that Ofsted story that you just heard referred to in the news. If you are a teacher or you uh, know any, alert them that we'll probably be turning our attention to the question of whether or not Ofsted is fit for purpose a little later in the program. And the COVID inquiry continues with evidence, I think, this morning, or certainly today, from Sir Patrick Vallance, the former chief scientific advisor to the government, whose private diaries have already revealed that he held Boris Johnson in, if was such a thing possible, even lower regard than we do. And speaking of Boris Johnson, or indeed the Conservative Party, there's also a story I rather like about the, um, a, 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 well, perhaps the return of the grown-ups, or at least the sensible people, if you are, as I was, surprised to learn that there are st still some people in the Parliamentary Conservative Party who consider themselves sensible or One Nation Tories. They are, for the first time in what feels like an age, they are flexing their muscles a little and submitting polite policy requests to Rishi Sunak. It does sort of make you wonder how any party can have both, for example, uh, David Cameron and uh, Lee Anderson under the same umbrella. I, I, I think there's an existential threat to the Tory party that we would and should be talking about. I haven't quite found the right way into it yet. But I begin with a story that perhaps cuts to the heart of that question of, of what conservatism is and why it remains popular in a country where most people suffer as a consequence of big C conservative policies. It is, I think, a Nairim Bevin who said that the great uh, challenge of the right-wing movement or the conservative movement in the 20th century was to persuade Labour, with a small L, to use their political power to keep wealth in power. So why would you want to keep wealth in power unless you were wealthy? I do not know. I usually quote Steinbeck at this point and his famous observation that the, uh, there were no such things as uh, poverty in Dust Bowl era America, just temporarily frustrated millionaires. And I think those two uh, statements, those two quotes, cut to the very heart of inheritance tax and everything that I find confusing about it. I, I do find this eternally and enduringly fascinating. Uh, in, investment, I uh, beg your pardon, inheritance tax affects about 4% of estates. The figure for 2020 to 2021, which I think is the most recently available, stands at about 3.73%. Let's presume it's gone up a little bit since then. You're looking roughly at, 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 at fewer than 30,000 estates paying inheritance tax. Fewer than 30,000, 27,000 in that given period that are susceptible to inheritance tax. And yet, opposition to it stands at about 37 percent today's first hour is going to be dedicated simply to the question of why so if you've already got an answer to that you don't need to wait for me to set my stall out you can jump in immediately and share it on 0345 6060973 because of all the things that seem to me to sustain inequality to slow down social mobility to um perpetuate the, the, the culture of cap-doffing and deference in this country, the attitude to inheritance tax seems to me to be one of the most powerful. Here are people who have accrued more wealth than they could ever possibly need and more than anybody else in the country has. And when they pass, they will hand on huge sums of cash or, or significant sums of cash and assets to their heirs, to their descendants or, or indeed to the charities and the institutions of their choice. At which point the government will step in and secure 
a significant chunk of it for the good of the nation, for the good of everybody. Um, you know, for the army, for the NHS, for teachers, for roads, for, well, pretty much everything that hasn't been privatised yet by the Tories. And, and the more money we can get for that stuff, and listen, of course, there are arguments about efficiency and, and, and scleroticism and whatever else you want to call it, but generally speaking, the more money we've got to spend on the country, i.e. everybody, stuff that we all either use or need or will do, then surely the better for everybody concerned. Except, I suppose, the people who can afford to pay their own way for everything from education to healthcare to... Well, you can't really pay for your own roads yet in this country, can you? But you take my point. So I, I, I'm a naive old soul. I've got a, a, a terrible tendency to, to lurch towards undergraduate idealism on some subjects. And I would stress, lest you accuse me of hypocrisy, that every single time we approach a budget or an autumn statement, for the last 13 years, I find myself being softened up by Tory governments. I, I'm, I, listen, I, I, I find the most fascinating question regarding wealth as how much is enough. And obviously for some people, it's never enough. Enough is never enough. Just, you know, the obvious examples are kind of like Rupert Murdoch, I suppose. But, but it's never enough. Some people love the work that they do, and it just ends up delivering ever-increasing sums of money to them. I think perhaps Bill Gates would fit into that category, and possibly George Soros. But, but for other people, it's, it's as if they can never have enough. And, and I understand that. I, I, I think now, if the wheels fell off, I could probably get to the finishing line, largely unscathed, but I couldn't yet reach the finishing line, enjoying the same standard of living for myself and my loved ones that we currently enjoy. I need a few more years on the hamster wheel before I get to that point. But certainly, you know, childhood dreams of living in an enormous castle with a moat and stuff like that, they don't, they don't feel like things like that I, I've given up on. They just feel like things that were a bit ridiculous at the time. So whenever a budget is approaching or an autumn statement, I find myself wondering why they're constantly trying to look after people who are already doing all right. And then I give my head a wobble and wind my neck in and uh, slap myself around the face with a metaphorical wet fish and say, well, because they want my vote. So they're buying my vote by reflecting my financial security and promising to enhance it still further. And then I think, well, when I look at percentages, I, I'm, 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 I'm very lucky. I'm very blessed. You know, I'm, I'm well into the 1%. And I'm not minted by any stretch of the imagination. That's the point. Earnings-wise, I'm well into the 1%. So if they're looking after me, how do people that they're not looking after end up thinking that they're looking after them as well? And I think inheritance tax is one of the best examples of that. I will. I don't think when mum passes that we'll be eligible for inheritance tax. It, it, we're not in that... Mum, mum and dad, we're not in that category. But as things stand... I will be when, when I pass on to my children. They'll be eligible. And, and right there, in that moment, I can begin to understand the politics of it because, I, you know, I don't want it for myself. I'm not going to be here. But this is a difficult world and it's getting more difficult. And social mobility has slowed down and there's been a sort of almost an ossification of financial strata. So just because I, I'm raising middle class children with, uh, with expensive educations doesn't actually mean that I'll be setting them up for life in the way that my dad was setting me up for life when he raised a middle class child with an expensive education. That The world is changing a bit. So it seems more important now to hand on as much moolah as you can to your children. But how tiny is that category? How privileged am I to be even thinking in terms of leaving money to my children and therefore feeling just that beginning, that flowering of resentment at the idea of you, the tax man, getting hold of it instead of it all going to them? But how ridiculous is that? In, in the context of representation, in a country where millions of people don't have a hundred pounds set aside for a rainy day, right now, the boiler breaks, you don't know what you're going to do. You run out of money before you run out a month, and you're going to be eating pot noodles for tea. I mean, it is everywhere, food banks. So inheritance tax will affect an almost negligible 
an almost negligible number of people. And yet it remains a very unpopular tax. And I just want to know why you think that is. I'm not at the moment in the mood for a big scrap on this. And and, and I say that because whenever I do say it, I end up having a big scrap. But I am... I, I, I've used myself very deliberately. I don't do that as much as I used to do. But I have used myself very deliberately here. It seems to me to be close to obnoxious that Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak are currently looking at ways to make me better off than I am today, right? And in the context of inheritance tax, to, to make my children better off in the event of my untimely death than they already would be. Because compared to the massive majority of children in this country, compared perhaps to your children, they've already done pretty well. Not as well, no, I mean, you know, not as well as other people. I'm not Jeremy Hunt. I've got seven flats in a luxury marina that I'm, I put up the rent on by 18% in the last few years while simultaneously complaining about inflation. I, I, I'm not a hedge fund man. I just do this. What, what I earn, I, I, I earn. I don't inherit anything. But I wouldn't mind leaving a bit. And that's, I can feel that just kicking in then. Why shouldn't I, why should I have to pay a percentage, 40% of my estate to the tax man when if I hadn't worked so hard to make so much money, then I wouldn't have to pay any. So, so I just am fascinated by that apparent dichotomy between the number of us that it actually affects and the unpopularity of it. I, I read this weekend that it affects about 4%. And about 37% of people are opposed to it. And I presume if you stick in the don't knows and the people that are in favour of it um, are going to be around about the same figure. I'll check those numbers for you. But but it is a, a tiny number of estates that are eligible for it. And therefore, I don't understand why the idea of increasing... Uh, uh, the, the number of estates eligible, not increasing the percentage that you'd pay, but by increasing the number of estates eligible is so un uh, uh, unpopular. And why Jeremy Hunt sees it as a vote winner, reportedly, although that seems to be slightly on the slide as a consequence of polling in the red wall. If, if you hit the numbers now, you will get through, okay? And that's the question. Why is a tax that affects hardly anybody unpopular with, look, tabloid headline alert. I'm, I'm going to use the word everybody when it doesn't actually apply at all, but it just sounds really pithy. Why is a tax that affects almost nobody popular with practically everybody? Um, unpopular with practically everybody. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. It's 10.16. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 20 minutes after 10 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I, and, and there it is. I, I, it's, a, it's a huge misconception. It's a bit like you, Les, in Oxbridge. Loads of people voted Tory at the last by-election because they thought they were going to have to pay a charge. But they, they didn't have to pay a charge and now no one's talking about you, Les, anymore. Uh, I wonder if inheritance tax is the same. If your estate is worth over £325,000, then you will have to pay inheritance tax unless you leave everything above that threshold to your spouse or, or your civil partner or a charity or somewhat oddly, a community amateur sports club. That's also an exemption as well, which means I couldn't leave it to kill Mr. Harriers, unfortunately. Um, and then, of course, when your partner or your spouse shuffles off this mortal coil that the 325 kicks in again so for a couple it's effectively it's a de facto 650,000 pounds so if mum and dad's house is worth six 650,000 pounds or less you're never going to have to pay inheritance tax which is almost all of us and yet there it is a very unpopular tax apparently despite the fact that it affects hardly any of us and i just want to know why why you think that is not necessarily the justification of it, the morality, the rationale, although we'll probably get on to that, but why you think that dichotomy exists between not having to pay it and yet being very cross about it. Johnny's in on teep. Johnny, what would you like to say? Morning, James. Hello. Don't savage me, please. Well, it depends um, what you say. <laughs> um, I think it is because the middle classes pay it and the rich don't. Mm. The rich get away with it. 
and um, this is this is your I personal think, animus, I suspect, rather than you 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 speak, <laughs> speak is indeed. For, yes, it, my, both my parents have died over the last four years. I'm and, sorry. Um, I paid a, a chunk of inheritance tax, and I have various rich friends who basically said that's absolute madness yes. that you've had to pay all that money. <laughs> No, I can't argue with you. I certainly can't savage you because you describe <laughs> you describe a grave injustice, albeit that you describe it from a position of, of relative privilege. You uh, look up the ladder and see people considerably better off than you who via creative exactly. cr- creative accounting and offshore uh, assets exactly. and all the rest of it. They, yeah. they, they, and trust. Yeah. And doing, they don't own the newspapers, do they, these friends of yours? They don't own daily newspapers in this country by any chance, because they were, or, or indeed... No, I think they're sort of more hedge funds than just extremely bright Cause, cause accountants. The royal family, I don't even know how bright you have to be. You just need to be able to afford to pay. Um, and, of course, the royal family fall into this category as well. But surely, surely, Johnny, this is an argument for going after those people with a little bit more alacrity. I totally agree. Yeah, I, yeah. I totally agree. I mean, I've got, you know, I, I've got friends who own, you know, large estates and, and, and they get passed down the line without paying anything. Mm. And it, 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 it is totally unjust. Totally unjust. Well, they're in trust. So you couldn't. For example, quite a lot of people inheriting the estates you describe wouldn't actually be allowed to sell them without either permission of trustees or a bizarre act of God. Well, I, I think there's a, there, there's, a, there's a line where it can be broken. Yes. But, um, um, but no, I think yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, no, it, it, they are in trust and they're passed on down, as you say, with the royal family and everyone else. I mean, all these big houses and so on, they just pass down, 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 and they never pay a bean. No. It's the middle classes that get hit. Well, and, and, and that's and, why it's unpopular. And that's a very big constituency of middle class because the middle class does not constitute 4% of the population, which is the only constituency eligible for paying inheritance tax. The middle class is like probably 30 or 40% of the population. But I take your point. I cannot dispute it at all. In your situation, having been unlucky enough to lose your parents in quick succession, but lucky enough to inherit an estate eligible for inheritance tax, you look at people who've inherited considerably more than you and balk at the way that they've managed to avoid their responsibilities to society. Yeah, it's kind of... I mean, I don't really balk at it, but it's... But it's a valid complaint. It's more that the the way way they say, that's crazy what you've had to spend... Because we 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 won't have to, or my children won't have to. Yes, and, and that how, that to. that rankles when when you bring children into it. That their children won't be susceptible to this charge, and your children will be. That actually rankles, and and I, I think you're in a small cohort, but I, I a cohort with a genuine grievance. I really do. But as we both agree, this is an argument for going after uh, aristocrats and hedge funders rather than complaining about being in the cohort of having to pay. You want to increase the size of the cohort, but that's very true. So you can talk about the 325 threshold or the 650 threshold. Oddly, there's people r- richer than Croesus who will not be eligible for it at all, 25 after 10. Paul is in Bingham. Paul, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Nice to talk to you. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got a, a little three-bedroom house up in Nottinghamshire. Right. And we paid... 30,000 30, 30, for it back in the 1980s. Yes. It's now valued at something like 275,000. Right. Now, I've obviously spent money on making improvements, but there's a huge amount of wealth there that I have now gained through no effort of my own. I've just gained it by owning the property. Yes. And basically, I think I should pay tax on that. Or when I die, certainly I should pay tax on it. (laughs) What have I done to deserve that? (laughs) This is the maddest inheritance tax phone in ever. The first bloke's paid it and is pretty comfortable about having to do so, but points out that his really, really, really rich mates don't have to pay it, and the second call doesn't have to pay it, but for perfectly rational and and morally just reasons, thinks that he probably should. Well, absolutely. I mean, what what have I done? I mean, uh, yeah, I've lived in the house as well, so yes. you know, I reckon the the extra wealth there is maybe one hundred and seventy five thousand. So it's not a vast amount of money. Well, it's not bad, is I it, die, for doing nothing? When just... I die, yes. what have I done to earn that? Nothing. I haven't. 
You, well, you're just, getting yeah, rewarded I'm, for being lucky enough to for being a homeowner. Absolutely. <sighs> so basically, uh, yeah, I think as a matter of principle. Well, I, 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 I mean, where would you put the threshold then? <sighs> Difficult one. It is, I mean, isn't it? Because three, two, five to me in the southeast seems, you know, that, that seems reasonable. But of course, you move out of the southeast, and three, two, yeah, five goes yeah, a lot further. Yeah. But but somebody who bought a house down in the southeast in uh, in the nineteen eighties, they're now worth I don't know. Maybe they've added a you know. Well, they could have added a zero. Yes, a huge, yes, huge amount. What have they done to earn that themselves? They haven't. No, they haven't. But they and have made every in, calculation. And lived in the house. Uh, yes, no, they've lived in the house, and it has increased in value often uh, at a greater rate than their salary would have would have um, provided. And the people, the people who are against inheritance tax, keep using lines like, "Oh well, I've worked hard to earn all this money, and I've already paid tax on it." Well, that wealth in property you haven't paid tax on. That's a very good point, actually. That is the argument you always hear. We've all, we've already paid tax on it once. The only bit you've paid tax on is the bit that you bought it with. You haven't paid any tax on the uh, on the bit that it has increased by. Um, so, if you've got a house worth seven hundred thousand pounds for a couple, uh, by the time the children are taxed, you're paying about twenty grand. It's not even that much for for, for most of the people that would fall into that category. It only becomes, I suppose, punitive when you're looking at two or three million pound estates plus. And as the first caller reminded us, um, Simon reminded us, um, a lot of them are going to be deploying creative accountants to exempt them from a lot of the charges. Any, oh, it's a funny old world. Thank you, Paul. All human life is here today. I often say I have the best callers in the business, and I think this morning's been a beautiful illustration of it. It is a lot more complicated than it initially appears, but reasons to have grievances now include, well, I don't really mind paying it as a relatively um, well-off member of the middle class, or well, the child of relatively well-off middle-class parents, but my really posh mates, the sorts who have their own shoots, they don't seem to pay it at all, and that seems a bit rum. I'm fully on board with that. It does indeed seem a bit rum. And then the second bit of the conversation would be, well, to be honest, why should anybody whose property has increased exponentially in value while they've just sat there watching Coronation Street or uh, East Enders, uh, why should they not pay more on that essential windfall? But it's an ordinary person windfall, which perhaps is why I, I, I don't go quite as far as Paul and, and think that the threshold should come down from 325. Because you want, you want such, I mean, inherited wealth is, is I suppose... Well, I was about to say it's one of the great antidotes to social stagnation, but I wonder if it actually is. I wonder if, in fact, it's the opposite. And it's it's actually one of the great uh, obstacles to social mobility. The time now is half past ten. Thomas Watts has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.33 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Where Where is it? Why? Why? Are so few of us affected by it. In fact, even my calculations look wrong. You've got another £175,000 per person, meaning that for a married couple, the threshold for inheritance tax is a million pounds. You've basically got a million pounds tax free. So if you're inheriting, if your estate is worth over a million pounds, you become eligible for it. If, for example, it was worth £1.2 million, then you would be paying 40% on. Two hundred thousand pounds. So you'd inherit a million pounds plus uh, one hundred twenty thousand pounds, which is all right, isn't it? Really? I mean, I, I, I guess. And then, as, as quite a few of you are pointing out, picking up on Simon's point from Antibe, uh, the, the people who are highly eligible for it, if you like, are going to be paying the best lawyers and accountants they can afford to ensure that they pay the absolute minimum they can get away with. And that's the most strong argument against it is that I, I shouldn't have to pay it as a, as, a, as, a, as a lucky middle class member because the really, really rich people, they're laughing all the way to the bank. But I don't know that that stands up to consistent scrutiny. Vivian is in Southampton. Vivian, what would you like to say? Well, I, I wanted to answer your original question, Thank which you. was why, against the why all reasons, yes, people yes. still... And, and I was thinking, well, I've, I mean, I've, I've been frustrated by this for about 40 years um but i'll just a, a case study because i've seen it up close yes. and personal on um, is my in-laws 
Yes. Whose family legend is really they they come up from a gardener on a country estate to yes. a firefighter who scraped together to buy his own house in one of the you know new areas out around Harrow. Yes. Um, and 1930 semi, and uh, someone else was. Uh, uh, you know, working in another sort of fairly working class profession and mm. they bought their houses. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think modern day equivalent to the people who were able to buy their council houses yeah. under Thatcher's right to buy. So they, they're very, very proud. They feel that's what they've achieved. You know, yeah. you and I might say, I achieved a, a the top rated radio program or I well, achieved I know, I'm also a proud, proud of proud of accruing um some some capital because it's what yes. distinguishes us yes. from people who are completely reliant upon their lords and masters for survival doesn't it Yes but I think then in comparison with where they came from or maybe some of their friends and neighbors and relatives they see themselves as wealthy Yes they have a modest semi and, uh, you know, I mean, recently it's increased in money, but I'm thinking back to the, well, the 1992 election, and my son was about five or six. He'd just gone to infant school yeah. anyway, and he, um, and he was trying to persuade my mother-in-law to vote Labour. Right. And, um, and she was saying, oh, I... Yeah, they, well, he's, he's a Labour councillor. Very precocious. Now. <laughs> um, <but> yes. <laughs> he, um, he, uh, he... He was saying, oh, Grandma, it's very important. You must, you know, it's very important. You must vote Labour. And she said, oh, darling, I'm so sorry. I can't afford to because they tax, you know, they bring in tax, they bring in inheritance tax. None of this applied to her. No. Does it apply now, um, do you think? Would their estate be worth more I than a million? I think it might do, yes. I mean, the thing is, my father-in-law died recently and obviously it didn't apply because she, well, not recently, you know, a few years ago. Sure. She downsized to sort of more, you know, one of these okay. wardens. Okay, but they places. feel, so, so, so it is, yeah. so if you, ah, so they always say that the happiest person is the person who lives on the biggest house in their street. It doesn't matter what's on the next street. So if yeah. you feel and this, this is wealthy. a fairly posh, um, yeah. yeah, she feels wealthy there because out of all the old people's flats. And also, she did. they did make a lot of money in the end because their house was in Harpenden. When the city of London became... I'm just going to slow know, you so down, if I may, Vivian, because I, 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 there's an awful lot of detail here and an awful lot of people waiting to speak. All right, so, so, yeah, I'll just okay, say... I'll say no, so I've been <laughs> looking at this. Sorry, this is just a case study yes, I, I saw up close. But I talk to people and they say... Oh, I don't want to pay tax. I've achieved this. Yes. And I think the most important thing, that why they buy into the tabloid headlines, why when the Lib Dems tried this mansion tax yep, go on. for properties over a million, it didn't work because people are convinced they've become very wealthy. So they think they'll be, they the think they'll be eligible for where it. They, came from. they, they th- believe yep. it. They don't believe what we tell them. They don't believe you. Don't don't believe the you. numbers. They think they'll be eligible no. for it because because of the journey that they have been on, and and when they hear the numbers, somehow the numbers wash over their heads. There must be some truth in that. There must be some truth in that because otherwise you wouldn't have the scenario that you have, which is the massive, massive, massive majority of the country are never going to be touched by inheritance tax. And yet, I mean, how much of it is Vivian's analysis of, of manipulation of the population, a sort of creating in your, in your mind the idea that you're part of the cohort that would be affected, even though you're just not and you're highly unlikely to be. And that's not an opinion. That is counting. John's in Barnstable. John, what do you think? Yeah, morning, James. Hello, John. Yes, yeah, very quick point. Um, I, I'm a, to answer your question a, against IHT on principle. No, that wasn't my, my question. My question was why are so many people who aren't affected by it against it? Uh, well, because the, the very wealthy are, are able to avoid it, as you as has been discussed with. Yes, but that's a lawyer. reason. That's a reason to go after the very wealthy. It's not. It's not. So a, in, it's not a reason so to, in, to to raise even less for the population so in, in general. James, my, my point is instead instead introduce a wealth tax collectible each year on assets. It's far better that the very wealthy pay tax on these assets during their lifetime. That's it in a nutshell. Would, would uh, that, I mean, surely you'd just deploy the same trust law and, and, and offshore tactics well, that you deploy now on inheritances, wouldn't well, you? Well, that's, that's for the clever politicians hard yeah. to sort. And no, they, fair and enough. Make sure, that, make sure that isn't avoided. Uh, we need more tax revenues. The very wealthiest need to pay more tax. 
that that's the way of working. And, and in the fact, then you work. remove that sort of unjust feeling of, of the tax being, feels like it's being levied on the heirs and the heiresses. It feels like it's being levied on the children but uh, when it's not, but it feels like it is. Whereas a wealth tax for living people, an annual wealth tax, which would be much smaller, of course, uh, on savings or on property. I guess one problem with that, John, is that a lot of us would perhaps not be able to afford a, a, a tax on our property, even though we can afford to live in it. We're, 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 we're kind of living close to our um, our means as it is. But yes, it does It does have an air of, of justice to it that is perhaps lacking from the idea of hitting people's children over the head with these demands. Andy's in challenge. So Andy, what would you like to say? Oh, hi, Jim. So, first time caller. Welcome. Uh, yeah. Uh, just, just a very quick one. I think this is to do basically, uh, it's to do basically with what you means test and what you rings fence. I mean, I'll give, give you some very small details. Um, I was unemployed for about two years, about yeah. 20 years ago, and had a high income and a lot of savings. So I got no benefits at all. I was out of work for about 18 months. Yeah. I had no problem with that because effectively I had savings. And so you were, you were means tested. tested for that? I was means tested in benefits, no problem at all with that. Yeah. Um, I've got an old age pension just now. Um, because I had a high salary, I paid an awful lot of national insurance. I get the same old age pension as everybody else. Yeah. No problem with that at all. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my, my problem is, is basically putting means testing onto things like old age pensions, where you can go, people have got a lot of savings, so they shouldn't get an old age pension. That, that's always been ring fenced and not means tested. Yes. And I think, I think it's the same thing. People feel it's a bit a, well. It's a universal benefit. Well, yeah, exactly. Now, if, what, they're, what they're doing at the moment, they're means testing inheritance tax. Yes. Uh, because obviously you've got to have very high levels of wealth, so it's means tested. So it's removing means testing, uh, I think it's what people really oh, want. Okay. I think pe- people object to it on the basis that, <laughs> effectively, you, you've paid tax on this, and I think even well, people have that are very wealthy... You, you haven't you, paid tax on it, because it's almost, for almost everybody, I, it's going to be I, your I, property. I, I agree, I agree. But yeah. it's the fact at the moment, we means test it at the moment, if you remove it, you're removing the means test. Mm. And I think I think people just approve of means testing on certain things and not means testing on other things. I mean, if you're talking about just generating wealth for the economy, it'd be just as valid to say, right, okay, um, even though people have paid national insurance, we should have basically means test pensions because people don't need the money. Mm. Uh, you can put it back into the state. Uh, that's my argument. I mean, people will agree or not agree with no, it. I I, I, no, people... I know. How much of it is what you think and how much of it is you speculating on what other people think? Uh, absolutely. Uh, to g- give you a quick example of this that you might not find humorous. Uh, my ex-wife I'll get on very well with. She's yeah. working and she's just got a rolled age pension. Uh, she's having to pay 40% tax on her pension. Uh, <laughs> because, And she really objects because, to Because that. of her earning. Exactly. Because it's Whereas part of her income. She, she, yeah. yeah, she's going, I paid the national insurance, yeah. why am I paying tax on it? Yeah. And my attitude is, well, tough. You know, <laughs> that, that's, just, that's just part of the income tax system. So we argue about this on a friendly basis. So I can see the two different viewpoints. Yes, I it. can as well. I can as yeah. well. I, I, yeah, and, uh, but I mean, it is, then we're left with the, almost a philosophical question of <clears throat> where are we comfortable with means tests and, and where are we uncomfortable with them? But I don't, I, And then we're back to that age-old question of how much is enough. So you would say, we'll put the threshold where it's enough. So no one needs to inherit more than a million pounds. No one needs to inherit more than half a million pounds. No one needs to inherit more than one and a half million pounds. So above that figure we will put a tax that is for the benefit of all of society. It's a, and it may even benefit your children's children's children who won't inherit anything because your children are going to, you know, spaff it all up a wall. But the, um, uh, to paraphrase Boris Johnson, but but yeah, that, so why should I pay it when you shouldn't? Um, that That's means test going, looking down the ladder and then not means testing, but why should I pay it when you don't? Looking up the ladder, uh, people like Prince Charles. Do you know how much Prince Charles paid in inheritance tax from the late Queen? Yeah, nothing. Uh, it, 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 this was a special dispensation agreed in 1993 by the then Prime Minister, John Major, which meant that any inheritance passed from sovereign to sovereign avoids the 40% levy applied to assets valued at more than £325,000. But I would add into that £325,000 per person per property. So if you're inheriting it from two parents, it goes up to 650 and then you've got a £175,000 uh, threshold on top of that. So it, it actually hits a million pounds. So the Crown Estate has an estimated 15 15.2 billion pounds in assets. 25% of the profits go to the royal family as the sovereign grant. The rest, I think, goes to the state. But they are held uh, in perpetuity by the monarch in the in right of the crown. So assets can't be sold. 
and they are surrendered to the government in return for a grant. So that's kind of like what we were talking about. It might look unfair that people aren't paying inheritance tax, but the arrangements, I guess the royal family will be an exception to this, but it would therefore be, the government's guidance concluded, inappropriate for inheritance tax to be paid in respect of such assets. So because they can never sell them, it seems unfair to tax them. But then, of course, if you're the Earl of Kidderminster, as I one day hope to be, if you are the Earl of Kidderminster, then you simply put the, uh, the, the, the palaces. I'll have one outside. I'll probably have one in Chattersley Corbett, and I'll have one in Haberley, and I might have one on the Offmore, Offmore Farm Estate, and I'll be the Lord of Agbra as well. That would be part of my demean. Is that the right word? D-E-M-E-S-N-E? Demean? Demeanor? Anyway, you just simply put it all in trust in perpetuity. So you just it goes to your heirs. That's why, of course, I've never worked this out before. That's why some distant cousin gets it all, isn't it? If you pass away without any children and then they find your distant cousin living in, you know, I don't know, living in a coal scuttle in Scunthorpe and they suddenly becomes Lord of the Manor because the alternative would be that it, it goes to the state or it goes... In tax, a huge chunk of it. But if it's a trust and you pass it on and you're never allowed to sell it, then you never pay tax on it. David's been in touch. He says, um, referring back, I think, to Vivian's call, he says, top marks for not sniggering at the words modest semi. I have no idea what you're talking about. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 10 to 11. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. It affects hardly anybody, and yet uh, almost everybody is opposed to it. It's a slight exaggeration for purposes of pithiness. But, but why is that? And a large part of the answer seems to be what you could call, what may historically become known as the uxbridge ulez principle, which is if you tell people that they're going to be eligible for a charge, then why would you bother checking whether it's true or not when you can simply vote against it? Uh, which is what happened in Uxbridge with regard to ULED. So you tell people, they, or even just create the impression in people's minds that they're going to be eligible for a charge, and of course they're going to vote against it. But then you've got a problem, isn't it? And, and that's a more societal problem of, of why people aren't a little bit prouder about paying tax, especially on money that has come as a form of windfall as opposed to a tax on earnings. Do you remember your first pay slip? Do you remember it? Do you remember seeing it? And just bulking at the figure of that just doesn't come to you. It's almost cruel to put the gross figure on a pay slip, isn't it? And then compare it to the net figure. And I know when you start work, your first few pay slips probably aren't going to hit you around the back of the head because you haven't reached the threshold. Or I was on emergency tax for my first few months at River Island because I, I don't know, I filled in the paperwork wrong or something. I think they were taking something like 50% of everything. I couldn't believe it. Now, obviously, I got a lovely rebate later. But goodness me, at the time, it was, it was quite unnerving. And then I got to work at Aquascutum on Regent Street. And I always remember this bloke. Oh God, I haven't told you this story for years. In fact, most people won't have heard this story because my very limited supply of anecdotes normally gets recycled endlessly. But this one, for some reason, has been in the fridge for about a decade. So I used to think this was a significant contribution to conversations like this. So I started work as a student. And this was before tuition fees came in this was when you just started having to take out a student loan to help with your maintenance but you still got your tuition fees paid for so it's a completely different universe from the one that's inherited by students and inhabited even by students today and there was a fellow working there full-time in the in the menswear department where i um spent quite a few years actually in the end and I, he was a very angry man. He was a, he was a very angry man. Looking back, I'm sure he had a lot to be angry about. But at the time, I just, he just stood out for his, for his anger levels. Um, and quite rude chap. He was quite rude to his colleagues as well, not just to the young whippersnappers like me who were doing it as a student job. And one time he came back from lunch, and I think he may have had a small sherbet. He came back from lunch even angrier than usual, and he, he got his pay slip out, and he was pointing at how much tax he paid on the pay slip and complaining that that was spent on educating me. And I thought he had a point, actually. I, 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 I kind of, I mean, I'm not going to turn around to a well-oiled menswear consultant on Regent Street in the mid-1990s and start explaining why my philosophy degree was going to be to the benefit of the whole of society in a way that meant that he was actually getting quite good value for money on his income tax. Or, indeed, point out what a tiny proportion of his income tax was likely to be going on paying the tuition fees of undergraduates. But the idea that you're paying tax... And a lot of it is being spent on stuff that won't benefit you. That that works. That doesn't make you a wrong'un, does it? Or a vampire? 
but the but the simple sense of and and then you create the idea that um, it's all wasted anyway. It isn't. We took a call, didn't we, last week from a young lad who t- said, "I think taxation is theft." And you just sort of think, oh, all right, mate, what are you going to... So you don't... Hospitals, schools, roads, armies, you know, whatever it is that the taxes have paid, you don't want any of that? It just It's just a silly position. But somewhere between those two posts probably lies a, a sensible path. 10.54 is the time. It won't affect you, but you hate it anyway. Why? June's in Heathrow. June, what would you like to say? It seems to be that people seem to know that the inheritance tax is um, for people who've got money. My sister died at the age of 56. Her husband died when her son was seven. She worked three jobs to keep the roof over her head and to keep everything going for them. Because of where she lives, the house costs more money. But she had to live there because she wanted to be surrounded by family to help her support her after her husband died. Yes. When she died, he had to pay £40,000 in inheritance tax. Now, all she paid, all she had left, was the money to bury her and her house. And her what? Now, how... The the money to bury her and what? Your phone went down. Sorry, money to bury her and her house. That's the only two assets she had when she died. Right. Now, she worked three, three jobs to keep that roof over her son's head. And there was no mortgage on it? And... No, there was no mortgage on it. Okay. Because they put the mortgage off, but there was... Um, well, I mean, you put me in a very difficult else. situation, because you could, you know, she could easily have had a small mortgage on it and only worked one job. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I say she's got no mortgage on it. As for, I know she had a loan on it. Right, well, that Which would, is a different thing to a mortgage, isn't well, it? Well, yeah, but it would still come off the estate. So, 40,000 per so, so there was about a hundred grand of asset over the 300 or over the half a million so she left about six hundred thousand pounds yeah. and she and you're and you're the house is worth and it's your nephew had to pay semi-detached no i know house. you told me that but so, so six hundred thousand pound estate and your nephew had to pay forty thousand pound inheritance tax yeah so 560 grand clear and I, I, yeah i know but it's still no i know why, but why, it's still 560 know, grand isn't it life. yeah how I much did she is, pay for the house but she's worked all a I, I don't know how much she paid for when it. When did she buy it? They come back from a... Oh, she bought it in 1982. Right. So she probably paid about a tenth of what its final value was, which is why she had no mortgage. Yeah. But, but I still don't think it's right. Why not? But someone that's worked all their... Because... Someone that's worked all their life... Yeah, but she got paid for that. She got, she got paid head. for working all her life. And she paid tax for that as yes. well. Well, she didn't pay tax on the half a million pounds that she made simply by owning a property for 40 years. <sighs> no, I'm sorry. I just think it is You don't wrong. have to apologise. Just, 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 just correct me if I've got anything wrong. I just think wrong. it should be means tested. If you've got these well, it people... Is mean, it is means got, tested. Like, she lived another... Sorry, it, it, she lived it is means in tested. part of the country to keep away from the... Keep away from the the family, who've yeah. got no support to look after because she's a widow. Yeah. She lived in another part of the country. He wouldn't have had to have paid that. No. Because the house would have been worth less money. So we'd have inherited less. Oh. No. Yes. Well, I just think it's wrong. No, I know you I, do. You I, keep saying I, that, I, I but I just... just saying, but I just, just think just, it's wrong. Yes, I know you do. But just to clarify, nothing I've said is wrong. Everything I've described to you is correct. 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 Yeah. But if you're working three jobs to keep a house going... Yeah. But there's no mortgage on the house, so, so you didn't... The biggest... Well, this is why I say you put me well, in a difficult a position, because you're reaching for... Well, that would have come off the estate, so what was left is what gets taxed, and if it was in excess of half a million pounds, and there's a 40% charge on, on anything in excess of half a million pounds after the loan has been paid. But... um. But the, I mean, and I think I understand where your sense of injustice comes from. But the number of jobs she did isn't really relevant. She she had she had assets worth six hundred thousand pounds, which puts her in probably the top ten percent of the population. However many jobs she worked <laughs> for three bedrooms, 
falling apart house. Well, it might have been falling <laughs> apart, but that's that. You know, that's not that doesn't change its value, June. You must understand what the house is worth is what the tax is determined by, not how many jobs your sister had or whether or not the window I frames think it's needed where painting. It is. Not what it's worth. No, it's where it's, it's how much it's it no, it's how much it's worth. No one says we're going to have a Surrey tax or we're going we're going to have a Blackpool tax. It's how much the house is. If you live in a two million pound house in Blackpool, then you're going to pay four hundred thousand pounds in inheritance tax. Can you imagine a house of two million pound house in Blackpool? What you get? Yeah, yes, I can. Yes. Yeah, well, I'm sure it would be less than a three bedroom semi that's falling apart. Would yes, you? It, yes, it, yes, it would. But the three bedroom semi is worth six hundred thousand pounds in the area where your sister's house was. I don't know what I can do to help yeah. more, really, with this. Well, I still think it's... it's I, I know you I do. I just don't think it's right. Yes, I know, but now we can agree that your reasons for thinking that don't really stand up, do they? <sighs> it's just a feeling. I still don't think it's No, right. I know, but it's a, it's a feeling, isn't <laughs> it? It is. It, yeah. it, 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 yeah. it is. It's well, there an emotion. It is. And there's nothing wrong but, with that, because your yeah. sister's tied up in it and your nephew's tied up in it, but the tax can't take into account your feelings. It can't be an emotional driven tax it just does she, she, she should have been able to leave everything she had to her son but then again you know who shouldn't be allowed to leave everything they had to their son someone in a one million pound house someone in a five million pound they've got to draw the line somewhere and they drew it in a place that meant that your nephew got five hundred and sixty thousand pounds out of a six hundred thousand pound estate which most people listening to would probably think was quite a good result albeit that it was tragic that he lost his his, his parents so young it's coming up to 11 o'clock. Thank you, June. That was really helpful, actually, because I think there'll be a lot of people like you who just feel the injustice of it, but the numbers don't necessarily back that up. Uh, up next, why is Ofsted in such a mess? James O'Brien on LBC. It is four minutes after 11, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, we'll park the inheritance tax conversation for now, but when Wednesday comes around and the budget starts, do find yourself... Do, do allow yourself a moment to wonder, particularly if you find my politics problematic um, and yet are also perhaps aware of the fact that, that I'm generally in favour of policies that would affect me negatively. Uh, so do, do ask yourself why these politicians, these right-wing members of the media or these members of the right-wing media spend so long attacking the metropolitan elite and yet whenever fiscal events come around, whenever budgets or autumn statements come around, they seem to be designed to delight the metropolitan elite. Just, I just have a little wonder about that um, because I don't know fully what the answer is except perhaps that they don't have your best interests at heart. And speaking of which, there's another story around today paid for by a secretly funded think tank and designed to whip up a, a, a bit of Islamophobia. So um, uh, you'll forgive me for not going anywhere near that until the so-called think tank responsible for the uh, um, uh, so-called research tells me who pays their wages. They've all got fancy titles, though. God, I tell you, it'll be a senior fellow of this and a director general of that and a Lord High Panjundrum of the other. It's incredible the job titles you can get if you go to work for a secretly funded think tank that doesn't deserve or demand any qualifications whatsoever to get big jobs. It's great. Uh, five minutes after 11 is the time. So we'll turn our attention instead to a completely transparent survey. Um... Uh, commissioned, I think, by a union, by a trade union. It has been undertaken by a former schools minister and funded by the National Education Union. It calls for a transformational alteration to school inspections. Now, when I turn my attention, well, rather more importantly, when I turn your attention to stories such as this one, I do feel the siren call of balance in the back of my mind. I do, I do sort of, I start from a position of equanimity, of, of seeing two sides to the same argument. So on this one, for example, the question would be, is Ofsted fit for purpose? Um, uh, the, the inquiry has found that it is seen as toxic and suggested that schools should self-evaluate. So I suppose it's, it's, it's part of the, the culture of the BBC as well, in which we were all raised as consumers and viewers and listeners. So you'd have, you'd, you'd have a debate and it would be like, is Ofsted doing well? Here's someone from Ofsted to tell us that it's brilliant. And is Ofsted not doing well? Here's someone not from Ofsted to tell us that it's not doing well. But I have to say that in the context of the education watch, watchdog, I sense that over the years we've spent together, and particularly after the suicide of the head teacher Ruth Perry earlier this year, 
I sense that the Ofsted conversation has moved on. And, and just to remind anybody who needs reminding that the Samaritans and other organizations are always at great pains to stress that an event as profound as suicide um, should not be attributed to any single factor or, or, or event. It's a, it's, a, it's a reductivist and often quite a dangerous thing to do. But we do know that this head teacher, that we do know that Ruth Perry had been uh, profoundly um, upset by the impact of Ofsted inspections upon her school and therefore her life. And that is a large part of the reason why this inquiry has been commissioned. So I, I think un unless you have a problem with this, in which case 03456060973, then I'm going to come at it from the presumption that Ofsted is a bit, at least a bit broken. We're looking at the Beyond Ofsted inquiry, which has called for a transformational alteration to school inspections, um, saying that the inspections are, uh, really should just stop. Ofsted respond by saying inspections are needed to ensure a high quality education. Do you know, I've just talked myself out of the thing that I was just trying to talk you into. I think probably we should ask whether these inspections are a good thing or a bad thing rather than just work so inspections per se i i see them as being a good thing but ofsted is clearly doing something wrong or clearly being suboptimal clearly not getting everything right this is a, a confined conversation i think this is really one where teachers need to talk to me and head teachers and Ofsted inspectors, past or present. I don't know what, what the rules are governing what you can and can't talk to me about, but I do want to know why you think things have gone so badly wrong. So uh, uh, you'd have a self-evaluation instead of an Ofsted inspection. And that would involve an improvement partner from outside, like an ex-head teacher or an experienced school leader, even a, a current head from another trust or another local authority, to go in and have a look at a system which currently delivers single-word judgments. And I have to say, I've always found that a little bit unkind, a little bit unfair. If you get an outstanding, I guess you're probably not going to complain, are you? But anything below outstanding, right down to inadequate... It just doesn't really tell a very detailed story. I, I mean, we get appraisals here, uh, as you could imagine. Mine is always outstanding, as, as you could imagine. But some of my colleagues who are deemed inadequate, yeah, they need a little bit more detail than that. They need, to be ex they need to have it explained. You can't just say, listen to James Moore. You've got to give them detail and guidance, and you've got to show them where they can improve and perhaps stop taking press releases from secretly funded think tanks and treating them like news. You know, that can't, that, you, you can't just put inadequate, can you? Or, 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 well, I don't know. I don't know. So I guess we're asking whether or not Ofsted is fit for purpose, which is a balanced approach to it. I, what I've done is give you advance notice of what my view of this is likely to be. So there it is. It, what, 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 well, if I say what's gone wrong with Ofsted, then I'm already concluding that it's not fit for... Do you know what? It's my show. I can do, I can do things that appear to be slightly contradictory. So is Ofsted fit for purpose? 0345 6060973. What's gone wrong with Ofsted? 03456060973. And remember, this is a bit like the last hour. You might be sitting there thinking, well, I don't care, I haven't got kids. But these are the people, the children whose education is under discussion, are the children who are going to be looking after you if you get poorly, or you know, picking you up if you fall, or teaching your children when you do have them, or, or, or looking after your grandchildren. You see what I mean? It's silly not to see education as a subject of immense national and intrinsic national importance. So what, what's gone wrong? And what what I don't have enough of a palette for this. I don't have enough background. But inspections, I, I kind of see why some people think they're necessary. But are we sure they are? You send in an outsider to inspect a school. I always think it's so much dependent upon the day that they arrive, isn't it? You know, what if, what if Johnny Miggins, who's a right little tear away, has got mumps? So Johnny Miggins isn't at school, so you come in to do the Ofsted inspection, and the classroom is an absolute oasis of uh, student commitment and scholarship. But if you'd come on a day when little Johnny Miggins was in school, it's like a war zone. 
But the Ofsted inspection has happened on a day when he wasn't at school, so you get an outstanding. If Johnny Miggins had been there, you'd get an inadequate. Do you see what I mean? I mean, that's the system. So it's not Ofsted per se that is fit or unfit for purpose. It's the current method of inspection. There you go. There is a point to these interminable monologues. I actually work out what I'm talking about in the course of talking to you. So it does the mode of inspection, the current mode of inspection work? Yes or no? 0345 973 And then, do we need inspections at all? And if your answer to the first question is no, James, it doesn't work, then what has gone wrong? What has gone wrong? 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. It's 12 minutes after 11. So the inquiry says safeguarding should be looked at in separate yearly checks with a new national body. I completely agree with that. It's academics from University College London who've undertaken this, looking at a whole range of options for reform based on a survey, based on focus groups and international comparisons. That's something other people might know something about. And also... A, a, simp- a bit of sympathy for the inspector, a bit of sympathy for Ofsted from Lord Knight, who says it's become under-resourced when you consider the high-stakes job that it has to do. That would almost certainly track back to austerity, the godfather of which has just been brought back into the cabinet as foreign secretary, uh, without ever being held to account or indeed properly scrutinised for the ludicrous raft of policies that suck the marrow out of many of our public services. So there's a lot to get your teeth into there. Um, And anything I've forgotten to say, feel free to answer that as well. Should we take a call before the break? I like doing that. It kind of jazzes things up a bit. It's a bit like wearing a piano tie to work. It just makes me seem quite zany and out there. Yasmin's in Tower Hamlet. In fact, the first two calls are both from Tower Hamlet. We'll start with Yasmin. What would you like to say? Hello. Hello. I'd like to to say that um, schools and particularly um, the senior leadership team become obsessed with getting um, an outstanding grade. Yes. Um, so you literally spend every walking, talking moment um, making sure that everyone's ready for the offset inspection. Um, like you said, if there's um, a badly behaved cl- class or student um, on that particular day, yes. then everyone spends the whole day in panic. I don't think any other um, profession is scrutinised in the way that teachers are. Um, we get constant observations. We're always being checked on, um, and it's just become an obsession. How long have you and been doing been the job? Seventeen years. What was it like when you started? It wasn't as bad as this because everyone wasn't obsessed with always getting an outstanding grade. Well, you can see why they are. It affects funding because it affects pupil numbers and it, uh, you know, re- reputation. Absolutely. But how much less scrutiny was there seventeen years ago? It, it wasn't as obsessive as it is now. When did it so change? We have, Do we know why? Um, well, I think it mostly changed because of the government's obsession with us improving our league tables. Right. So it's all about the numbers. It's, it's much less about the actual students. I've never heard a teacher speaking warmly of it actually i don't think you, will, you won't do because basically our lives have become a misery based on that word based on the words offstead inspection but what if you get yeah. an outstanding surely everybody's happy for a few weeks oh no if you get an outstanding then you're told you should be doing better next time you can't do better than outstanding exactly but you know in the last school i worked in we got an outstanding yeah and we were told you mustn't sit on our laurels because Next time we might not get an outstanding. Uh, I see. So you don't even get five minutes of pleasure from getting an outstanding. Because you're automatically worried about not getting about losing it next time. Absolutely. So, and to be honest with you, I. Think well, I hope you're that, always honest with me, Yasmin. <laughs> but I think parents put too much um, store by the words as well, because there's lots of ways of masking the inadequacies of a school. So parents shouldn't believe an outstanding offset anyway. OK. No, there's a lot there to unpick and there'll be lots of other contributions as well. But the general sense of it not being very good for teachers doesn't necessarily, your final comments notwithstanding, doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad for parents or pupils. But I, I would have thought that a, a, a school full of happy teachers is likely to be a happy school and a happy school is likely to be a good school. But then possibly I'm being a little naive again. Yasmin, thank you. It's 11.16. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 
Uh, 19 minutes after 11 is the time. I may have to clear a, a line into the building for this, but I really want to speak to a teacher who likes Ofsted inspections. And I don't mean that in a glib way or a, or a um, mischievous way. I just, I don't know if I ever have. So just in terms of my own personal collection of, of ticked boxes as a radio presenter, can I please have a teacher who likes Ofsted inspections? Some, a proper teacher, all right? Not, not an Ofsted inspector who used to be a teacher. A proper teacher currently working who likes Ofsted inspections. Um, for whatever reason, 0345 606 0973. Chris is in Tower Hamlets, one of my regular educational correspondents, who I will introduce like a proper guest. Chris is a former headmaster who follows the education sector very closely and often treats us to the fruits of his knowledge. Chris, what would you like to say? <laughs> Good morning, James. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, you, you mentioned the international comparison. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, as you know, a, a great believer in in following the evidence. Yes. You know, if something works, even if I don't like aspects of it, I'll support it. But it, it, it doesn't work. I mean, it, it plainly doesn't work. If it did, yeah. you, you wouldn't have a third of, of teachers leaving the profession, you know, five years after they entered it, every single year. You it's wouldn't incredible, have isn't it? the government missing its recruitment and retention targets for the last 10 years, every single year, if it was. But the international comparison is the really crucial one. Google this if you don't believe me. Of course I believe you. The, uh, the Finland yes. is the key word. You know, everybody wa has always wanted to talk about Finland, including in particular Michael Goh. Mm. You know, look at Finland. Look at how well they're doing. Correctly, because they lead the, the educational league table right. you know, for OECD. Finland, and now they did lots of things about 30 years ago, crucial things, but one of the things they did was they abolished their, edu their inspection system completely and replaced it with a culture of responsibility and trust, which, you know, which valued teacher and, and principal professionalism. And instead of punishing schools that, that were seen to be, in, in inverted commas, failing, yes. they, they targeted, you know, more and more resources and help and support to those, those teachers and those schools. What's and the, it worked. What, 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 it did work. I, I, I don't need to Google it. I'm familiar with that. Also, they start much later, I think, in Finland as well. Yes. They, they really yes. did tear it down and build it up again. So talk me through the culture change then. Why would Gove be citing Finland while simultaneously bringing in an awful lot of the things that contribute to some of the problems you've just described? Yeah, the, 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 the phrase cherry picking springs. Oh, uh, OK, springs yes. You know, you look, look at the results. Don't look at the way... You know, you achieve those results and the and the resources that you have to put into it, you know, to make it work. So, what what's the culture then that you're describing that that wasn't in place when you were in your pomp as a headmaster? Is it is it is it a presumption of guilt until innocence is proven? It's almost as if yeah. teachers are. I mean, yeah. Ofsted inspectors are, are have are, have far too much power, and teachers well, are to. Be suspicious to be suspicious of a teacher until they prove that you shouldn't be. Perhaps. Yeah. L l let me. Th this is this is not an this is not anecdotal. This is this is really critically important mm. I, because I was there when Ofsted was first invented. So I I saw yeah. the you know Changed. the system growing. Yes. Uh, my first inspection in the school, same size school all the way through. There were fourteen inspectors spent a week inside my school before they came to their judgment. Wow. By, by the time I left, an Ofsted inspection lasted for a day and a half. Uh, and, okay. you, and, we had, and the last inspection, I believe, we had four inspectors. And they start feeding back to you on their judgments halfway through the second day. But that's ridiculous. Yeah, well, absolutely. Be like, I mean, I'm just thinking about what I do. If someone came in on a random day and tried to judge the output of an entire year, it would be palpably absurd. Exactly. I mean, that first inspection was was actually really very supportive because, of yeah. course, they went everywhere. They, they 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 were in dozens and dozens of lessons. They were in the playground. They were in the school canteen. They attended. You know, I never knew this. So I Garfield. never knew this. So what was it? Funding then? They just they just ripped the funding out of Ofsted, and therefore its yeah. ability to do the job that it was set up to do was completely compromised. So you just focus basically on the exam results. 
And then, you, uh, yeah. So, I mean, and also you get stuff like this, which is anecdotal, but also I think pertinent. Yeah. Oh, this is from Angela. At my daughter's school, on inspection day, all the teachers stood outside cheerily welcoming the children, which never <laughs> never normally happens. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, here, here's the really critical thing, yeah. James. At the end of my first inspection, the, the wonderful woman who, who led it, she, she also ran a company which trained Ofsted inspectors. Right. She said to me at the end of the inspection, Chris, would you mind if I used all the material that, I, that we've, you know, garnered on on this school mm. for training purposes? She said we'll anonymize it. You know, uh, we'll we'll call it Ocean School, and you'll yeah. be Mister you'll be Mister Cod. Yeah. Uh, and she said that the the aim is that they go away for a weekend. She said I give them all the data, and I say to them, right, tell me about this school. And they all they said, you know what they're all going to say? I said, yes, they're all going to say it's a failing school. She said exactly. Okay. And it's and over the weekend, she said I'll show them why. If they look closely and carefully at the school, they'll discover that it's actually just a very challenging school okay. facing very, you know, challenging problems. Well, that, in the area. That, that's always been one of my amateurish uh, objections to this whole scenario, this whole system, is that from your point of view, to, 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 to simply get a child to attend who wasn't attending, never mind to get a, you know, a D up to a C, is a much greater achievement than retaining an A grade at A grade. And yet under these systems of measurement and inspection, the first two examples are by the by, while the third is the holy grail. Yeah. yeah. That, that just exactly. doesn't make sense, does it? Because it's the opposite of what education is supposed to mean. It's, a, you know, leading out from the latin isn't it not just maintaining high quality if you're lucky enough to have high quality no, students to if, start with and if the quality is is really that good how do you explain you know these i mean really jaw-dropping figures you know suggesting yeah, that children's quitting. enjoyment of school is well no but that's the teachers but the, but the, oh, students, the kids yeah you know the the, the numbers an alarming 52 percent of 15 to 17 year olds saying they dislike school 52 yeah, percent that, that is alarming i don't know what the numbers used to be but um it, 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 it well there's some good news are you, are you ready for this you might want to sit down yeah. <laughs> rishi, rishi sunak's given a speech he's got five more pledges although these are long-term <laughs> promises and it's the it's, I'll, I'll run through them all, Chris, because, you know, it's that kind of program. But it's the fifth one I want you to hold on to your hat for, all right? Yes. Reducing debt, cutting tax, securing energy, backing British business, and wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, world-class education. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. 45% of classes in, in the country don't always have a maths teacher teaching their math lessons yeah. you know I mean, yeah. yeah but details details it's a pledge mate you know well just never mind the never mind the content feel the width world class education who's been in charge for the last 13 years why haven't we got a world class education at the moment rishi sunak i don't know never met the man highly unlikely that i ever will but goodness me the list of questions i'd have if i ever did it's longer than your arm longer than the average ofsted inspector actually that's not even that long anymore that was new wasn't it so you'd go in like a sort of crack sas team back in the day and therefore the inspection would be both thorough and helpful whereas if you cut it back to the bone david cameron george osborne thank you once again you've cut everything back to the bone you're going through the motions and all you can really look at is oh look there's some teachers outside greeting all the pupils cheerily it's 11 28 mike's in maidstone mike what would you like to say hi james Hello, uh, first time caller very long time listener good man welcome um, thank you um now i i want to speak about a different perspective still offsted yeah but early years so Ofsted regulates nurseries as well as uh, child minors course, yeah. as well as schools. Uh, so often forgotten. Um, but I've worked in schools as well. I've seen the pressure uh, to use one of your phrases, footballification. Um, there was an article only yesterday, I think it was, Guardian, yeah. Yeah. talking about head teachers getting fired, you know, bad offset or even a good. You right. know, the school's got outstanding. But not outstanding, yeah. Absolutely. So you've had this pressure. But in early years as well, so I used to run four nurseries. Right. And um, so our first nursery, we got outstanding within six months of opening. Of course, we were pleased. We were really happy shouting from the rooftops. But if I look at it, I think, were we really outstanding? Um, although I was pleased with it, what is outstanding? Mm. Um, second one, we didn't do so well. Second Ofsted, we got requires improvement. Right. Now, when I look at it, that was two years, two, three years down the line. We were far better um, run, far, far better organised, everything than 
the first one where we got outstanding. So it does make you think. But just to give you an example of their inconsistency, James, um, so I know a nursery who got marked down from outstanding to inadequate. And one of the things cited was that the Ofsted inspector wasn't happy because, so just to give you an idea, the children would help. They'd have a couple of helpers to go and collect lunch at lunchtime from the kitchen, a nice little task for them. They'd help each other pour drinks uh, for their table. And so the children, the Ofsted inspector wasn't happy because the children waited five minutes Mm. uh, for their lunch and marched them down. And that was literally something. So it's it's, it's binary then. It's got nothing to do. So it's an, it's almost a dehumanizing. We're going to run out of time, Mike. I I, I would, I would have hurried you, but I didn't. Um, It's dehumanizing then in a way. Yeah, it really is. And just to say another Ofsted inspection, another area. Um, praise that children were waiting five minutes for ah, their lunch. So Lord it's totally Lord. inadequate. But the last thing I want to say is the pandemic. Um, you had, so nurseries were one of the only things open. Yeah. Yeah. So you had, so rightfully so, nurses were getting a lot of praise, but nurseries were open. And of course, you can't social distance from a um, two year old who no. leaves their nose blown or whatever else or sneezing all over. Of course, so you can't. They were under a huge amount of pressure. And, you know, we were immensely proud of our team. But they did a, a brilliant job. Ofsted were off. They weren't inspecting. They right. weren't coming So you out. didn't they even get any up. credit for that? They came back like a dog with um, after a bone and they were marking down nurseries and schools like crazy and oh okay no that is interesting yeah, but but i yeah, am go- i am gonna have to go to the news no. so I, c- I can work out the rest i hadn't i hadn't thought of that gosh yeah because again it's being done in a sort of tick box binary way it is eleven thirty one, and thomas watts now has your headlines james o'brien on lbc james o'brien on lbc Here's a funny thing. So I mentioned to you with my tongue in my cheek a moment ago that I've never met Rishi Sunak um, and I certainly don't expect to be able to interview him or ask him any questions anytime soon. And that's fair enough. I, I, you know, I'm not um, uh, I, I, it, 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 sort of moaning unduly about that. But because I think this iteration of the Conservative Party is awful and, and I've made that pretty clear and it, it, therefore it would be a hostile environment. I suppose, for them to come into. And there are plenty of people prefer- prepared to um, provide them with a much warmer welcome. That's part of the problem with the whole country, really, is that even Boris Johnson could rely upon several members of this profession to tickle his tummy when he was presiding over the, 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 the sort of moral collapse of our government, really. But you would expect Rishi Sunak, as a former city uh, player, to have a little bit of respect for the Financial Times, would you, or not? Just um, and and you know the the political team at the Financial Times are exceptional journalists, um, including the deputy political editor Jim Pickard, who's just been at this speech in North London where Rishi Sunak has laid out five more pledges, and Sunak declined to take a question in in a speech, you know, a pre-autumn statement stroke budget speech, declining to take questions from the Financial Times seems to me to be a little bit rum, to say the least. So Jim has helpfully provided the questions that he would have asked. And the first one is something that everybody should be asking Rishi Sunak. So if you do hear him or see him being interviewed anywhere and the interviewer doesn't ask this question, that interviewer is letting you down because this question is key. Why do you take credit for falling inflation this year when last year you claimed that rising inflation was outside government control? That's not, that's not I don't think, a hardball question. That's just asking politicians to tell voters what they mean when they use certain words and part of the problem that we've got in this country at the moment is a failure of journalists to to pin them down on this kind of stuff so if it was outside your control last year when the news was bad how can it be this year a consequence of your actions when the news is good and the second one is should landlords be lifting rents by more than inflation which i think is a little nodge nodge i've just invented a new word i like that it's a combination of an it's like a nod and a nudge if a nod and a nudge had a baby together, it would be a nodge. And I think that the question there about landlords is a nodge towards the front page of the Daily Mirror today when it has been reported that rented a flat owned by Jeremy Hunt has increased by 18% at a time when he was urging pay restraint. And, uh, and of course, you know, it won't be a massive contributor towards inflation, but it would be a contributor nonetheless. So that's a, an 18% rise 
in rent at one of the seven luxury apartments that the Chancellor and his wife own in Southampton, which is Rishi Sunak's constituency, isn't it? Oh, isn't that sweet? It's a small world. Uh, back to Ofsted. I have not yet got a call. Can I just check? Have we got anyone waiting to talk to us? We haven't heard yet. And this is silly, and I'm not being mischievous, or it's not a gimme or a gotcha or anything else that begins with G. I um, want you to tell me, as a teacher, why you like Ofsted. Why you, why you like Ofsted. That's all. A teacher who likes Ofsted, please. 03456060973 is the number that you need. A teacher paging, paging a teacher who likes Ofsted, please. That's all. I think it's an interesting question, possibly an important uh, issue if we can't find one among all of the people listening to this programme, uh, many of whom are teachers. Ruth in Greenwich. Ruth, what would you like to say? Oh, morning, James. Hello, Ruth. Um, I, my fund was a little bit stolen by your um, head teacher. Don't um, worry. But cause I, I was going to talk about, and I, if, if you don't mind, I'll still sort of recheck a couple of points yes. and then we give you some sort of anecdotal evidence just to show how, on a personal level, Ofsted has dramatically changed. Ah. My first... Is that OK? Yeah, of course. Yeah, right. My first Ofsted was um, 29 years ago last week. And I know that because it finished on my 40th birthday and this Friday I was 69. So it's embedded in my mind. And just like <laughs> your previous caller said, uh, we were a school of some 650. Every department had their own inspector. Yeah, I didn't know this. Yeah, they came, they introduced themselves, all 12 of them, 12, 14 of them, in a, a staff briefing. And um, I was head of department at the time. I might have been head of year as well. And um, I, I was seen at least three times across the spectrum from sixth form to year seven. Um, my department, when I had, I had quite a lot of um, non-specialists, as you can imagine, uh, drama, we were drama. Oh, yeah. um, so, but, and again, and he would often come and feed back to me and sort of talk talk a little bit about, you know, you might want to look at this or, you know, so-and-so's doing well there, but. Um, so although it was, you know, I'm not saying it wasn't a scary experience. I mean, we, we'd had a sort of huge sort of celebration at the end there was not these one word stuff we got a proper report it was like an old hmi yeah so you were fine so let's fast forward um and i think the next one we had and it's when the when the there's still no fear i, I can give a time when again my colleague and i suddenly the room that we were supposed to use we were both teaching gcse uh, and it, something happened and we couldn't use one of the we had a very small studio right. so we, we literally team talked in the hall, no fear, no, oh, my God, it's yeah. not going to be the scheme of work. And the inspector came in, and and it was it was peachy. You know, yeah. they commended us for thinking on a feet. You'd never have done that. I then moved into sixth form, and um, the first inspection, um, again, it's, it's scary, but it's not terrifying. And the guy with the lead um, inspector was the biggest guru in drama, A-level drama going. So he came to see me, I, I think, just because he wanted to yeah and it's, it was one of those lessons that just wasn't going to plan right. and i can remember going oh stop 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 no no this is no good and completely went off track but he was there to see the whole lesson and his comment at the end was would you like to come on tour with me and show them how to teach sixth form that's good Let, so so i'm a good teacher james yes. i could get standing at the drop of a hat right Let's fast forward to my is the penultimate this is how many, they it etched in your mind Woman come by then. When, what year was this? Uh, so the first one would have been two, 2005, and yeah. the next one would have been about 2012, 13. So that was after they brought in the um, the, the, the one word framework. Yeah, yeah. Well, or I think, yeah, yeah, you were starting to get all that. And we were then, I was, worked in a sixth form college, which, which has then been taken over for all sorts of reasons. Yes. Um, and we were now three sites of over. Two and a half, three thousand students. Each site was ge geographically about five miles apart, and we then yeah. have four or five inspectors. Somebody comes in to see me. She stays for ten minutes. She did say to me as she walked out, "That was so very nearly outstanding." Mm. So I said, "Well, what was Why made?" Wasn't it? It? Yeah. And she she said, "Well, you know, there was no group discussion." And I said, "So I picked up my lesson plan and pointed." And said, "Well, there will be." Yes. And she, but I won't see that. We haven't got anything to discuss yet, mate. You said, "I hope," or I words did. to that I effect. Yes. We're doing all the practical, yeah. and she said, "Yes, but I won't see that." That's interesting. And I said, "Well, could you stay and see it?" And she said, "No." 
So in the end, it almost be- because they had a tick box of what. So it's not it's for. not the fault of either the system or the inspector. It's just that the resourcing of Ofsted mm. has mm. lost track with the role of Ofsted. It is, and also because, and then fast forward to the next one where I wasn't seen Stop at all. Stop fast forwarding. Well, it is, sorry. <laughs> Carry on. It's because I'm really old. And yes. I've had off no, you're not. Don't be um, <laughs> Well, quite good. Um, but the last one, yes. what you are then aware of, that they have now come in with a focus, and that focus was all about marking and feedback. And they were pretty much not interested in almost anything else. Yeah, because because they can't be. To be fair, yeah. I'm not I'm not defending them. Well, I am defending them, actually, because I understand the issue a bit better now, which is why we do it on the radio. So they, they have no choice because they've got to they're getting judged as well. They've got to do their job. So they've got to fill something in. They've got to come back with some form of inspection that's been completed. But because they're under resourced and have little time, they end up narrowing and narrowing and narrowing the focus absolutely. of their inspection until they're essentially delivering bobbins. Well, not, I mean, three, what I say, we had four inspectors or five uh, across three sites of, of huge thick forms, and they finished their inspection on Wednesday afternoon. And how are you supposed to? And, that's for, and how, how many years does that inspection then cover? How many years does the judgment sit, well, sit for? Yeah, it was about five. And we that's were, madness, we were isn't it? That's yeah. nobody's fault except the people who've ripped the Absolutely. funding out of the inspectorate. We didn't even try to get an outstanding. We we knew we couldn't because of results, because we're Lewisham and, you know, New Cross and wherever. So, it, you know, it's quite difficult, quite a difficult area. And our results were pretty good, but they were never, we could not reach. So it was like, if we can get a good, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um. Ruth, I mean, there is. A, I'm still not here. I feel. I feel I need a little banjo and a song lyric. And I've never met a teacher that likes Ofsted. It's like a rubbish George Formby song. Um, Stephen has even posted a picture of some tumbleweed spooling across the screen. Have we got? Have we got one yet? Have we got a teacher that? We've got, but that's got to matter, hasn't it? We've got. To, I shall tell Lord Knight this when we speak to him shortly. It's eleven forty-five. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 11.49 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. A bit of a break with tradition when it comes to guests and experts on the programme. But this Ofsted conversation has been so interesting that I thought... Well, I thought I owed it to you, actually, to speak to Lord, previously Jim Knight, who's chaired this inquiry and um, and come up with these conclusions. Jim, thank you for your time this morning. Um, uh, I've spent the best part of half an hour trying to find a teacher who likes Ofsted, and I've failed. Uh, does that yeah. surprise you, and is it significant? Look, it doesn't surprise me, and uh, you know, in, in some ways you could say uh, it was always going to be the case. No one loves mm. an inspector. You know, maybe uh, no one loves a referee, but uh, <laughs> the, the very strong evidence that we've received in our inquiry, and I've seen repeated elsewhere, is that the inspection system has lost the trust of the profession. Uh, it's also increasingly losing the trust of parents. You know, they've seen tragedies, they've seen people yeah. leaving the profession in their droves, and they're worried about the impact that that has on their children. Well, what are the, the key areas that you've identified then? I, I just, again, I tell you that we've spoken to head teachers past and present, and one thing that I wasn't aware of was that at its inception, Ofsted was a completely different proposition. An Ofsted inspection yeah. would involve a significant number. One school in Tower Hamlet, 16 inspectors would go in and stay there for a while, and they would really be you know, forensically examining the quality of education on offer, now you might get one turning up for a day and a half and delivering a one-word judgment under which the school then has to uh, live for the, you know, for, for, for three or four years more. So what are the key areas of decline that you've identified? Well, exactly as you've described it, James. You, you know, 20 years ago, you did have a proper expert report with people having the time and the resource to, to properly understand right. the school. And we could go back to that, but it, it cost a fortune. And frankly, I don't know of a political party that's going to want to sign off that money. Um, and when I've looked around the world at what other people do, you can do it differently. And everybody else does it differently. Nobody else does a single snapshot, one and a half day judgment that then can end the career of, of a head teacher. So what other people do is that they mix more transparency over the outcome data to 
increase the accountability to parents locally, but alongside that, having an expert school improvement partner, if you like, who mm. comes in, uh, probably a serving head teacher, it might be more than one of them, who then works with the school leadership around where they might be able to improve. That's great professional development for those head teachers coming in as well, incidentally. So you start to create a self-improving system. Uh, and and then the, the, the process is one about how can we help people improve rather than how can we take a snapshot and then judge them and write them off, so which you, is yeah, why we have a culture of fear at the moment. Well, you'd welcome that as a head teacher, wouldn't you? So if, if, if I'm understanding this correctly, what, what you've established and what has happened over 20 years is it's not necessarily a deliberate policy reversal or a deliberate introduction of the system that we've ended up with. It's almost like a process of attrition, a chipping away at what was there until what is left is, it, is just not fit for purpose. Yes. And the other thing, to be fair, that I would say is that politicians like me, you know, I was a schools minister a while ago, um, is that we have linked Ofsted outcomes to accountability. And that then ranks up, you know, ramps up the pressure even further. You know, at the moment, if you get the wrong Ofsted judgment, then your school can be forced to become an academy or it can be moved from one academy trust to another. You know, those are really big uh, big outcomes that, yeah. that massively affect a school and means that for a head teacher, the pressure is really on and that then goes all the way through the school and even impacts pupils who we've heard from who've said, yeah, th- they feel the pressure. They know that everything changes when, when Ofsted is coming. Has Is there a country that best exemplifies the sort of system that you favour, that you prefer? Is there, is there any way you looked at that you felt was getting almost all of it right? Well, actually, I, I didn't go have to go that far to like what I saw in Wales, to like mm. what I've seen in the Republic of Ireland. But I've also I really like what I see in international schools, where there are various quality assurance schemes in place, but where we see this form of peer accreditation um, really working. And and the other thing I should say, James, is I do think there is an important role for Ofsted in making sure that these big school groups, I chair a large multi-academy trust, 28 schools, £150 million worth of turnover every year, and I do so with very little public accountability. Mm. That can change. Ofsted can come and hold me to account for how well I am making sure that that school improvement process is working well. Sort of overseeing the overseers, as it were. Yeah, that's right. So, yes, of course, you know, in any kind of work, you've got managers who are telling you what to do. And, you know, there's a little bit of tension around around that at times. Um, and we're saying at the top of the tree of management is the leadership and the governance of these big school groups. And they're the ones that we should really focus on in holding them to account. And, and finally, Jim, the uh, the report, the Beyond Ofsted inquiry commissioned by uh, the National Education Union. What happens to it now? I mean, how optimistic are you that, that some of your suggestions will, will be taken up? And perhaps as a mark of how frustrating that process may prove to be, I can't currently remember who the Secretary of State for Education is, but I do recall <laughs> that not that long ago, Andrea Jenkins was a minister. So I don't know how optimistic you are about a, a warm reception from the department. Uh, look, it, it, yes, the ministers uh, change a lot. Gillian Keegan, uh, someone just said in my ear. Yeah, uh, congratulations <laughs> uh, to your ear. Um, yes, it is Gillian Keegan. And look, I, I think she knows that it's got to change. I think the incoming Chief Inspector Martin Oliver yeah. knows that it's got to change. Um, and both, you know, all of the political parties are frantically drawing up their manifestos for a general election in the next year or so. And I think they're listening. I think that they know that this regime uh, has passed its sell by, de- sell by date. And I hope that they're listening. Well, we shall see. Um, many thanks indeed for your time today and, and indeed for the, for the conversation that your inquiry has inspired on the programme, that Beyond Ofsted inquiry, chaired by former schools minister Lord Jim Knight, funded by the National Education Union. And we brought the interview in with just enough time to take one more call from Sally in Birmingham, who's been waiting for ages. Sally, what would you like to say? Hello. Um, uh, it, it's been a very, very interesting conversation so far. I think we've had our well, own... Don't spoil it, and... Sally. Don't spoil it now at the end. Well, I was going to... I was going. To, I was trying desperately to think of a way to say, you finally found a teacher who appreciates and likes Ofsted, but I, I just can't. Oh. Um, I, I'm afraid. I would say I do appreciate, and I think every school leader and teacher in the country would appreciate the need for some kind of accountability. Yes. There's no doubt there. Um, but uh, I agree with 
well, I think just about every single caller that you've had, Ofsted's not, and the report, Ofsted's not fit for purpose. Uh, our own situation was that we uh, were a good school. We became a requires improvement school because of one check on the single central register, which we put right at the time of wow. inspection. Yeah. Um, our inspector really did not deal with our kids well. We're a very, very small, very alternate independent school. And uh, despite us really trying to hammer home that our our kids are a wonderful bunch of kids, yes. but really aren't very used to strangers, she uh, she bulldozed her way through them, I think is probably a good way to describe it. Yes. They complained about feeling threatened, about feeling set up, and that is not the culture that you want to instill anywhere well, in any school. It also means they can't, they can't undertake a proper assessment in those circumstances. If the children have been alienated and upset, you're not going to get a picture of what the school is like. On a day-to-day basis, are you? So, exactly. so not to defend the inspector you encountered, but simply to fit your evidence into the bigger picture that we've assembled. It, it, I mean, she is going in with a very um, set yeah, modus operandi, felt, which is yes, determined in part yeah. by by the by the lack of resources and the lack of. So she's she's only got one song really. She turns up and she sings it, and then she goes exactly home again. Exactly that. Yes. Exactly that. Making a square peg fit a round hole is never going to work, and that's why we have so many different types of schools. Uh, and that is great, but you then have to fit your inspection to to manage that. I think. And and the other thing is that I'm not sure many people have talked about is their complaints process, which yes. is. Has, has long been known to not be fit for purpose. You, there's just no point in complaining. We did complain, um, and it got us nowhere. Uh, we were not surprised by that. Uh, I, I think... So there's, no the there's, there's no recourse? There's no recourse at all. There's no Their independent body that looks over their complaints is, is run by Ofsted anyway. It's all so insular, it's unbelievable. And uh, funnily enough, speaking of insular, what, what, one of the things that another teacher has asked me to point out to... To Jim Knight is that in the 80s, they had a system when an inspector would be attached to the school. But one of the reasons given for stopping that system was that the inspectors were getting too close to the school. So no one thinks it's easy. Uh, Sally, perfect conclusion. And and you kept the quality threshold as high as it had been throughout. So I'm very grateful to you for that. It is coming up to 12 noon. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Some interesting uh, developments at the COVID inquiry. We'll be catching up with those in the next hour. Of course, a few people have pointed out using the Finnish example, which was Chris in Tower Hamlets' model for improvement, not actually um, the uh, uh, Lord Knight, who's chaired this particular inquiry, but, but um, it doesn't mean he would disagree. Quite a few of you pointing out that that ties in with the conversation we had in the first hour about taxation, because the system in Finland I think um, demands a a different approach to taxation among the general population than we currently have in this country. But up next, suing big tech and why? James O'Brien on LBC. Three minutes after 12 is the time. Story that I've rejected. Uh, Young Britons turning to AI chatbots for help with school and work because I think there's a bit of a moral panic underway here. I've spoken to my own about it and AI uh, chatbots are making their way into the classroom and into the educational process in a way that is going to be very unfamiliar to uh, older people. But it isn't necessarily time yet for a moral panic about it. And also, you know, we'll wait until we know a little bit more. A story that I've selected instead, um, and and the reason I'm mentioning this is because they speak to a similar sort of segment of of society or, or similar sort of issues, is a story about... Uh, young people joining forces to take legal action against big tech, as we call it, um, Silicon Valley or or, or big social media giants in particular. Now, it's an American story, this, but I'm pretty confident that it will be familiar to plenty of people in Britain. Hundreds of American families are suing Meta, TikTok, Google and Snap Inc., which is the owner of Snapchat. Now, the American legal system is quite weird anyway. It, well, that's not fair, is it? It's, and also, I'm going to stop saying America. The United States, the legal system in the United States is... Uh, I, 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 I just met a lovely woman in Birmingham when I was on my book tour, and she pointed out that America is a continent, not a country, and I'd never really properly registered that before. So can we put this on the list of things that you remind me about? Because she, she, I think she was Nicaraguan, and it, 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 there's a lot of benighted 
territories in that part of the world. And I've never really registered that it that it means a lot to people. So if you could, just give me a little nudge every time I say America when I should say the United States or the USA. USA is probably easier because it's a form of cultural colonialism, isn't it, almost? To, to, or imperialism, cultural imperialism, and it's not right. So for USA com- companies, for companies in the USA, and the, the re- reason why I mentioned the legal system is because class act, well, it's two continents, actually, I suppose, technically. But anyway, you take my point. The um, class action system means that when you can assemble hundreds and hundreds of plaintiffs against big, very, very wealthy. Erin Brockovich is where I'm getting this from. All right, I'm not doing it. I haven't done a, I haven't studied American law. I'm getting it all from Erin Brockovich. So if that film is incorrect, I apologise for this thumbnail sketch of how the American legal system works. If it's if Erin Brockovich took liberties with the facts, with the actuality, but we don't have class actions in this country in the same way, which is why these uh, issues, these cases perhaps don't come up as much. And here, and indeed, the legal case hinges upon the platforms being harmful by design. And and indeed, a British schoolgirl, Molly Russell, is likely to be cited as an important example of the potential harms faced by teenagers. Poor Molly, I find that story almost unbearable, by the way. Um, but the but the bombardment of material about self harm and suicide and depression that. Molly was subjected to as a consequence of how the algorithms work was a massive wake-up call for many families, but I suppose perhaps not for the platforms, not for the tech companies that that facilitate that sort of process. Um, and, And the case is going to be really interesting. The judge has already ruled that a lack of robust age verification and poor parental controls are not issues of freedom of expression, which is... Uh, what what the big tech companies would have claimed. The family's saying, no, it's not a freedom of expression issue. And, and, and it speaks, doesn't it, that question to something that we talk about quite a lot when it comes to freedom of choice. It's not a free choice to drink fizzy pop when billions of dollars are being spent on encouraging you to drink fizzy pop and no dollars are being spent on encouraging you not to. And quite a lot of these bogus libertarians talk about freedom when in fact they mean... Uh, a, 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 a removal of any obstacles to letting epic wealth control discourse and behaviour. So it's not a freedom of expression issue if you are deliberately engineering what young people see. You're taking away their freedom in many ways. It's an almost totalitarian relationship. Um, and and th- that, that, that's the backdrop of the conversation that we're going to have now. One of the young people who is part of the case is quoted as saying, and this is what we're going to talk about, addiction in this context. If I had my phone taken away, it felt like having withdrawals. It was unbearable. Literally, when I say it was addictive, I don't mean it was habit-forming. I mean my body and mind craved that. And again, as with Molly Russell, it it, it is the self-harm pages that this young person, Taylor Little, is most haunted by. She added, it felt like a cult. Uh, you're constantly bombarded with photographs of a, of a body that you can't have without dying. That refers to body image and eating disorders, and you can't escape that. So there's some of the backdrop to this conversation, but I want to come at this from the angle of addiction because I I we I mean we did it with hard drugs not long ago. We we actually talked about where the line is between use or even excess use and actual addiction. And it was an incredibly powerful conversation. Incredibly powerful. It was only last month. And I think it might be even harder, perhaps, to pinpoint when a young person's social media use becomes addictive. And listen, if you want to bring an adult experience into this conversation, that's fine too. But I guess you're going to struggle... You're going to struggle to make a legal case for an adult having been, what's the word I'm looking for, damaged? Yes, damaged, abused even by big tech. You, you, you know, the notion of freedom of choice with your use of social media to an adult is going to be a slight, is going to be a much more straightforward proposition, I think, than it could be for a young person, particularly if they're accessing material that they're not supposed to. If the age, very well, that's the crucial point, isn't it? That's the age 
verification um, processes that simply don't work. They're not worth the screens that they're printed on, are they? So, so that's really what I want to talk about. And I suppose we'll be coming at this initially from two angles. Either you are, well, three actually, even perhaps you are in the grip of what you would genuinely describe as an addiction to. And it's a, it's a particular type of social media at the centre of these cases. It is, it is the sort of social media that draws you to graphic material with no warning, um, often at, at, at very, very young ages, 10, 11 years old. Uh, so you may be in the grip of that, although obviously I hope not. The second category of people who may be able to contribute to this will be parents who have watched children fall into the clutches of sites dedicated to really grim and graphic issues and material and you have watched it happen with almost a sense of powerlessness and that perhaps is where addiction kicks in or we will be talking to someone who's come out the other side because what I want to pin down is when and how it becomes an addiction when and how does it become an addiction because we all use smartphones don't we we all use Almost. Don't text me to tell me you don't have a smartphone. Seriously. It's just a waste of everybody's time. Uh, send me a carrier pigeon instead. We, we, we all almost all use social media. Don't text me to tell me that you don't use social media. I, I accept, I acknowledge your existence, but it is not a helpful contribution to the conversation that we're having, unless the reason why you don't use social media is because you're a recovering addict, in which case I very much want to hear from you, ideally on the phones. Michael has texted already to say, as someone who has been in rehab for drug addiction, I can tell you that a number of key workers told me that in the next few years, smartphone rehab will be a thing. And that is probably a more broader notion of addiction than the one we're looking at here, which is the grim and graphic sites and images scenes and sites that are being knowingly put into children's hands highly addictive and damaging products which is why hundreds of other american families families in the u.s are suing four of the biggest tech companies in the world so how are we going to pin that down and i, I don't i don't really do performative ignorance i think i perhaps used to i used to exaggerate how little I knew about an issue, not out of deception or dishonesty, but just because I thought it was a better catalyst for getting you to call in and inform me. So I know my way around social media. I'm not big. Well, I am quite big on TikTok, but I'm not a big user. I know I'm big on TikTok because my kids told me, but I'm not a big user of TikTok. Um, but I know how it all works. And I, I'm not going to pretend that I don't. But what I don't know is where you would draw the line between use and addiction, between safe and dangerous. And that's what I want you to tell me. I'm also interested in whether or not you think there could be a case legally for uh, treating some of these tech companies in the same way that you'd treat a pharmaceutical company that was allowing children to get their hands on opioids. 03456060973. Actually, that second bit there really focuses the mind, doesn't it? Because if, if you found that established companies, rather than illegal dealers, if you found that established companies were exploiting loopholes and failing to properly supervise a system that, as a consequence of which, meant that children were getting their hands on opioids and getting addicted to them, there wouldn't be much dispute or debate about legal responsibility would there or indeed the success of a case so that i suspect is is key to this is pinning down whether or not you can describe it as an addiction to something that they shouldn't have been able to access in the first place that works doesn't it intellectually so you get addicted to something that they shouldn't have been allowed to access in the first place the question is how did they access it the answer is well they were buying it off a, a dealer on a street corner well that's not the responsibility of the pharmaceutical firm that made the opioids or the or the opioid substitute no case to answer tragedy but then you've got children who are accessing the allegedly addictive material via platforms that are controlled and could be much more robustly policed to ensure that young people don't get access to the grim and graphic material that can be both traumatizing and addictive question in the event of them suffering major trauma or and or becoming addicted how responsible are the suppliers answer very 
Because it's not like some street corner social media knockoff that they're getting addicted to. It's, it's, it's the big stuff. It's the mainstream stuff. It's the big four, they would argue. It's quarter past 12. Hit the numbers now. You will get through. 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. In the very, very specific context of social media usage, how would you determine and describe addiction? Actual addiction. Because we normally associate it with chemicals, which you ingest. This is different, but the question remains the same. Hit the numbers now. You will get through. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 19 minutes after 12, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, I mean, we may broaden out the question of addiction uh, uh, beyond the sort of sites that uh, poor Molly Russell was being bombarded with before she died, and and the case study that I gave you on this, because um, well, but because of the response that I'm getting already, Mike tells me I went to Afghan with the army on a couple of tours. For the first month or so, I'd feel my phone buzz in my pocket and reach for it, even though we had to hand it in before we were deployed. In the last six months, I've closed lots of my social media accounts as I was spending an unhealthy amount of time on them, and I'm in my forties. That, well, I mean, that's just a loss of time, though. It's not necessarily doing you damage. That's the question I should have asked. So add damaging to addictive. When does it become dangerous or damaging? Because most of us are probably mild, or many of us are mildly addicted to it. But where, where, where does the damage kick in? And uh, already a mention, as there should be, of the great hack on Netflix, which, I mean, if you had to boil down the most interesting element of it, it would probably be the fact that an awful lot of the executives at the kind of firms that we're talking about don't let their children anywhere near the product that they're helping to put into the marketplace. That's quite significant. You know, imagine if you found out that an LBC presenter didn't let their children listen to LBC because they were worried about what it might do to their young brains. All right, maybe a couple of presenters, but generally speaking, we're a, we're a fairly healthy diet of, of discourse and debate. Imagine, what would you do if you found out I didn't let myself... You're listening to this now in the car with your children, and someone lets you know, it's found out, that he doesn't let his own children listen to it because he thinks it will warp their minds. You'd be pretty perturbed, right? Well, that, that is one of the central revelations of the great hack on Netflix. That, that, that they're queuing up some of these Silicon Valley... Um, uh, honchos to explain why they don't let their own children near the stuff that they help to put into your children's hands, bedrooms, lives. Rob's in Milton Keynes. Rob, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi, James. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a product designer. I've worked for a long time at the heart of these kinds of products. And there's an interesting and little-known fact that most of the people who run the big four, as you put them, went through a class at Stanford, which is a behavioral science class, which mm. basically teaches you how to build products and services that are addictive. Yes. And um, what we're doing with the way in which these things are built is creating serotonin uh, response stimulators that act in exactly the same way as gambling does. So you get patterns built into these that are asymmetric responses to certain types of reward. In the case of kind of uh, Facebook, for example, it's bad news because bad news keeps people addicted better than good news. Does it? In the case, yeah, yeah, ba bad news. But I get it. So you think of serotonin as being a nice thing, but it, but your brain tells you it's a nice thing, even though it's being prompted by bad things, by nasty yeah, things. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Because they, bo they both create fight or flight stimulus, which uh, effectively makes you double down on a certain type of response. And it, you know, it comes from the early stuff around Pavlo Pavlov's dogs and all of that sort of stuff. Where they, under they found out how animals respond to certain uh, denials of a treat or rewards and how you control animals. I mean, after all, we are animals. And once you kind of unpick that code a little bit and built it into a system, then it's very, very hard to escape the maze. And, and that's totally by design, because the longer you spend... A, attached to something and the more you reach for it the more money they make but but then again the general experience will not be problematic so how much do you punish the undamaged user for the 
experiences of the of the damages. Do you know when I first learned about this? I'm not as surprised by that. I didn't know there was a single class at Stanford that they all sat. But it was when I was researching fixed odds uh, betting terminals actually that I came across the psychology of state corporate harm maximization, where you <laughs> it's it's a carefully calibrated. Um, calculation, isn't it? Where, where you need yeah, to yeah, get yeah. people to keep, you need to give them just enough winnings to get them to keep putting more and more money in. If they, if they, uh, if they want a bit less, they'd give up a bit earlier. And if they want a bit more, they'd give up a bit earlier. So you're trying to just get it absolutely no, sure. perfectly, perfectly measured. But is it, I mean, you make, we make it sound like something apocalyptic and new, but, but really this is what businesses always do. They try and get as much customer as they can. Well, they do. You're right, but with something that's in your hand and permanently about your person, that's then the, new the opportunity. Bit. The opportunity to do that is greatly enhanced, isn't it? And the, and the people who win in that space are the ones you reach for first when you open your phone. I mean, you only have to kind of observe your own behaviour around your phone to see how well these things are designed, because your thumb goes to a spot on the screen by design. You know, and the the design is the is the winning app that takes your attention, and you know we all know who those are, and the things that happen when you get into those spaces, whether it's you know. Yeah, but like, where where is the line though? When does it become a damaging thing? Well, you know, you talk about people not letting their kids near things. Yeah. My kids, my kids were schooled in not being on it, and I'm not on any of that stuff. And as a family, you know, it's not it's not something we restricted, but I made sure that they understood what they were getting into. And certainly, our youngest one doesn't isn't on anything, and has never been by by his own choice, you know. And he's and to a degree, he suffered because he hasn't seen. You know, friends in the way that he might have done, but I would say he's kind of clean. It's a funny, it's a funny, it's a funny thing. But you know, I think we all suffer. We suffer greatly, and because you know, it's not something you can see. You know, it's it's very very insidious. What do you? It's what do you? What so? But you make your living out of it. I make my living out of designing um, things. So you're in the you, sector. You, you're in the sector, but you're not necessarily at the, at the, the in the front line of this particular. Well, I was in the first wave of it all. So we built um, I know, Facebook I know, I'm trying to... platform, you know, and yeah, I, so but... I know how this works. And, 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 but and... What's your, your lad's going to use it when he's older, obviously. So it's, uh, no, it... he's 18 now. He's 18 now. And he's now. still not and in it, he's still, really. He's still, not, he's still not on it. And, okay. you know, that's his, that's, his, that's his choice. I think he's an outlier in that. And, and you know, but I, I, I you know, you, you only have to watch the people around you and the way we all reach for things. You know, you go to a... Yeah, but this is where I get this is this is where I think about moral panics because it's also brilliant. You know, it's it's also I can find somewhere to have lunch now. I I can find a bed for the night. I can find, um, I can find you know two hundred reviews of my new book, How They Broke Britain, published by Penguin in uh, the best selling eighth best selling book on Amazon last. I can find lots and lots of good stuff. So it's not a reason to get rid of the portal just because I can also find bad stuff. I'm not saying it is. I'm saying that the 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 kind of key players in the attention economy have engineered it to such a fine point that if you use any of those things, then you are never dragged into it because of the way they're engineered. Yeah. You know, TripAdvisor isn't the same. You know, it's, it's on a spectrum, but it's not an attention hogger, is it? It's a utility. Just the problem is you've either, you've either lived it or you haven't, haven't you? Because I, I, I mean, I got mildly addicted to those collections of films of people accidentally hurting themselves. Or, or, <laughs> yeah, ideally, exactly. or ideally, the ones where children accidentally hurt adults. I find those hilarious. And, and now my Facebook feed is absolutely full of them. But this is not the stuff of either addiction or particular danger, is it? Unless yeah, I'm losing up to it, it, unless I'm doing it at work and I lose five hours, unless I start doing it now and you libel someone and I'm not paying attention and the producer's gone to the loo and Ofcom are listening and we all get, but it's not, it's not going to have a, a deleterious effect on my life, really. But, but, but not necessarily, but but you think about the kind of the wormholes you've gone down with uh, the ten second videos on YouTube. You kind of come round and you go, oh my god, I've just spent ten minutes yeah, doing that. Yeah. How did that happen? That's on purpose. No, so no, I know, I do. I, I guess in there is deliberate. Yeah, no, I know, I get that. I just, I guess, in my own experience, I've quite enjoyed that ten minutes, and I don't feel that it's had any particularly damaging effect on my life. Which brings us back to the sort of sites. Would the serotonin thing or the dopamine thing apply there as well? Then, if you're looking at self harm sites yeah, and anorexia, yeah, of course. Eat- of course, oh, that's because awful. you're, you're ch- yeah, yeah, because it, you know the algorithm doesn't care what you look at as long as you spend enough time looking at it, yeah. and it's going to give you more of the thing that 
you've told it you want. It has no conscience at all as to what it shows you or doesn't. You know, which is why moderating these things is such a horrific Sisyphean task. Yes. And so damaging to the people who do it. And why... Oh, I've read about yeah, that. I've yeah, read about it's, that. It's, 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 it's why... And you're, know, sitting in a, you're sitting in a cellar in San Francisco being paid a relative pittance and you're being exposed for eight hours straight to some yeah, of the or grimmest... Kenya. Or, 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 or outside, or, of course. You're in Bangalore, you know. Yeah. Uh, all, all of that, that horror is outsourced, isn't it? Do you talk about yeah. it much in the profession? Do you talk about a, a reckoning that, that that this can't go on like this at some point, some <laughs> somehow, somewhere, there's going to be a big crack clampdown on what goes on or not? You know, the, these sorts of things, they're kind of outright a conversation because so many people yeah. make their living out of them, well, you know? The point, and and, and that, that's, that, that's one of the, the difficult things about it is, you know, we live in a world of dark patterns where everything is dark designed patterns. to game you. Dark patterns. Um, yeah, that is mm. it. Charlie Booker again, way ahead of the time. Thank you, Rob. That's really helpful. I'm drawn to perhaps naive questions about the ease and the speed with which we've become a society where parents exercise very little or no control over what their children can look at. And if the parents can't do it, then whose job is it? Answer the people providing the images. But their age verification systems are, are meaningless. It's coming up to half past 12. You're listening to James O'Brien on at LBC. We'll catch up with events at the COVID inquiry after the headlines. And after that, I want more on this. I really want to nail down the point at which it becomes damaging. Because me watching people accidentally kick their dad in the ghoulies, even if I suddenly notice that I've wasted an hour and 20 minutes watching video after video after video, it's not... Do you see what I mean? It's not, it's not addictive and it's not damaging. So wh when does it become either or both of those things? 0345 6060973 is the number you need. Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.34 is the time. The, 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 the questions surrounding the COVID inquiry remain a little nebulous. You, you know, I've shared this with you in the past. I, I, I'm keen to talk about it more. But some of the problems are almost intrinsic to the whole process. No one will be found guilty or innocent. It's, a, it's an exercise in learning. It focuses on the government's response to the pandemic. But, uh, you know, in contrast to what many of us would like to see, it will not cause, in, in, in any instance, punishment or, or consequences. And the more evidence emerges, the more some of us find ourselves thinking that we would... Um, Quite like to see some punishments or consequences, but it's been the turn of Sir Patrick Vallance today, the former chief medical officer, to give evidence. And Charlotte Lynch has been keeping a very close eye on proceedings. And ultimately what he said so far, James, is that the UK was just too slow to act to control the virus. He's got 200 pages uh, worth of a witness statement, which they are picking through now. They have been uh, for the last two hours. And it has been shown in the last few minutes an entry from his diaries, which um, he said he was keeping at the end of almost every day as almost a brain dump for his own mental health because there was just so much going on. Uh, and in it, he said that Boris Johnson, of course, at the time, Prime Minister, was clearly bamboozled by the science. And it was a real struggle uh, at the time for him and other scientists to get him to understand the data. Um, it was also shown a diary entry from January 2020 where he quotes the former Prime Minister as having said, my gut tells me that this will be fine. So ultimately he is saying he was pushing for measures to be introduced my sooner. Gut. Boris Johnson's gut. Exactly. He went from his gut, apparently, in January 2020. Um, there, there was talk of some tension between then him and Chris Whitty as things started to escalate about whether they should have gone sooner um, in the lockdown. But he said the operational response, so actually implementing these measures, he said, just weren't effective. Now, he's asked here uh, about MPIs. If you've been keeping across it, you'll have heard this term NPI. Now, that is non-pharmaceutical interventions, the scientific term uh, that they were using for lockdown. There should have been an operational plan to have those ready to pull the trigger on as soon as they were needed. And what we see is it takes quite a long time to get those actually working and to get the process in place to do that. I think that is a sort of learnable lesson that you should start earlier. And I think um, 
I, I take the comment Andrew Parker, the previous head of MI5, has said very clearly that he heard the warnings that we were giving in early February and took actions in that organisation to do things. I'm not sure that that urgency of action was as consistent and as reliable as it should have been across Whitehall at that time. So he, of course, uh, didn't expect his, his diary entries, he said, to, to be made public. In fact, he said he he would write, you know, what, what he had to say at that day as this mental health brain dump, he described it as, and then um, never intended on reading them again or even, you know, thought that they would see uh, the light of day. He also qualified, um, you know, some of those. He said they were instant reflections um, and qualified some of those by saying that he would then sometimes have a completely contradictory view uh, in the days that followed because Gosh. so much was changing. It's very human, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when so much is happening, he was trying to, you know, keep keep control of it all, especially in such a serious uh, situation. Um, but he was, and, and he wrote in his diary that he was advocating for measures to be introduced sooner. And Chris, Chris Whitty, uh, of course, the chief medical officer, he at one point in this diary entry described as a delayer. Um, right. But upon reflection now, he said, actually, it, it was right. And they worked together well because Whitty was thinking of, you know, the health picture as a whole, uh, what impact it may have on the NHS, you know, people who might be experiencing loneliness or other health issues, unable to get to other appointments. And he said that they, they levelled each other out. But ultimately, um, he said that measures should have been introduced sooner. He did say there was a week long delay in March 2020. So they've been focusing on that weekend when the trigger was pulled, lockdown was introduced. It was first mulled over in February, he said. Um, but there were objections from the Prime Minister and Rishi Sunak as Chancellor at the time. He said... Um, mm -hmm. Um, Patrick Valance had suggested even locking London down because it was yeah. ahead of the rest of the country. I remember that, actually. But he said that that objection actually came from Rishi Sunak as Chancellor because he was um, worried about the impact on the economy. Uh, which this is, a, this is the heart of everything, isn't it, yeah. Charlotte? Is that the objections were built upon the idea of the damage it would do, where the scientists were explaining that the sooner you do it, the less damage there'll be. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the fundamental crisis. The other thing we're learning, perhaps obliquely, is why they're so keen for the WhatsApps, why we still haven't seen Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak's WhatsApps, because if Patrick Vanners didn't think his diary was going to be seen by anybody ever, it's probably fair to say that the Prime Minister and the Chancellor were writing WhatsApps that they certainly weren't expecting to see Absolutely. the light of day at any point subsequently. And we know that when people like Sir Patrick Vallance were telling them, you know, making suggestions like, why don't we lock London down? Um, we know that there was opposition from Rishi Sunak as Chancellor and Boris Johnson as Prime Minister, but what were they saying to each other ah, behind yes, the backs of those people. Good grief, the mind boggles. Well, it doesn't boggle. It just, I mean, I mean, what it means is that what they actually were saying to each other must be worse than our most fevered imaginings. We can only we can only imagine so far, but but yes. we we may not have to. Um, so there, there were those objections. He was asked directly by um, counsel to the inquiry, Andrew O'Connor Casey, who's questioning him um, about whether even that week earlier um, would have made a difference if we'd locked down in March 2020 a week earlier. But as you'll hear him say here, it wouldn't have made a difference because at that point we'd already lost control. Even with that because we got seeded so widely across the UK, not from China, not from the countries where people thought this would come from, but from Europe, with huge importations, and we can see this in the genomics. Is this, this is half term? This is half term. And we had a huge influx from Spain, France, and Italy over that half term and beyond, which meant that we probably had lost control and test, trace and isolate only works at low levels of prevalence and a high level of ca capacity in the system. With everything that we had in place or didn't have in place at the time, I'm afraid that the sort of ultimate option of trying to lock things down probably was the only route open at that time. So he'd been pushing for, for earlier measures. I mean, as early as February. In fact, in, in January 2020, we, we saw him making these diary entries where the Prime Minister said, my gut tells me this will be fine. Um, so he, even, you know, a week earlier, if we'd locked down a week earlier, Sir Patrick Vallance saying that it wouldn't have made any difference, even if we had that effective test trace and isolate mm. system, which we heard at the time, many people said we should have had sooner. But he said at that point, we, we'd got so much of the virus in this country that had come in from Italy, from Spain, 
uh, from half term holidays that we'd already, you know, at that point lost control and lockdown therefore was inevitable. These non pharmaceutical interventions were then the only way uh, to start flattening the curve. We haven't seen anybody's reputation damaged while giving evidence yet, have we? If anything, the opposite has happened because so many roads seem to lead to Boris Johnson in particular and Rishi Sunak and Matt Hancock. So uh, Valence's uh, testimony corroborating a lot of what Dominic Cummings said, Mm. for example. Um, I think later today he's expected to reveal that Anders Tegnell, um, his opposite number in Stockholm, where Sweden often cited as an example of lighter touch, he, he... um, uh, reportedly told Patrick Vallance that they needed to do more to combat coronavirus for the reasons that you've just reported. The, the, the idea that we were letting it reach a point where the seeding... I, we were sitting here talking about airports, talking about half-term, talking about holidays, and just being completely baffled as to what was going on. But I guess the blood on the carpet comes when Johnson and... Yeah. Hancock and Sunak are in the room. Exactly. And we're expecting that. We've not got an exact date confirmed for them. Uh, but in this module of the inquiry, so it's it's, set, it's been split up into four parts. In this part of the inquiry, this is all the juicy stuff about political decision making. Yeah. And it is, you know, going to reach that point where we hear from Boris Johnson and he will have to answer, you know, to these claims that we are now hearing, as you say, Dominic Cummings backed up by Sir Patrick Valance. We're going to hear from Chris Whitty as well, who are all, you know, saying the exact same thing, which is Boris Johnson was bamboozled by the science. He was making decisions too late and just thought that it would be OK. And that bluster his way through it. Here is, mm. here is the massed ranks of the world's scientific expertise. And here is Boris Johnson's gut on the other side of the scales. And he's minded to go with the gut rather than the scientific expertise. Finally, Charlotte, he, he doesn't seem that discombobulated by the fact that his diary has become public. So, albeit that he's qualified a couple of things where, as we might all do if we kept a daily diary, you've changed it, I might say, that's Charlotte Lynch has got right on my <laughs> bananas today, and then tomorrow but she's the best colleague I've ever had. And and you can say, but the, in terms of the substance, the central thrusts of it, he doesn't seem unduly unhappy about it all coming no, now out no. into the public domain. And I think what you what you get from him as you're watching him, I mean, he, he's still, um, you know, he's got complete c- conviction and, and what he's saying, he still believes, you know, um, he, he was advocating for the right thing, uh, which was an earlier lockdown. You know, of course, there was this question asked about, oh, was there tension between you and, and Chris Whitty? And I admit when that question was asked, my ears pricked up. Mm. Um, but he said, yeah, he thought that we should have yeah. delayed a bit. I thought we should have done it sooner, but actually that's why we worked well together because he was thinking of the overarching health impact and I was thinking about the oh, virus yeah, COVID-19. Yeah. Um, so it balanced each other out well. So he, he doesn't seem embarrassed at all. He doesn't seem concerned about anything that he's written. Um, quite the opposite. Yeah. In fact, he stands by everything he said. Uh, Charlotte Lynch, many thanks. C- c- continuing to watch the COVID inquiry and uh, uh, even if something remarkable happens in the next 15 minutes, you will come steaming back into the studio. Otherwise, later today on LBC. It's coming. It's just gone 12.45. Back back next to this question of when danger and addiction kicks in. A few of you worried about my developing habit of watching children kick their dads in the ghoulies. Look, I exaggerated slightly. I might once have noticed that I'd been watching it for an hour, but it doesn't mean I do it every day. I can go for weeks without watching any films of people slipping over on ice or out of control cars or whatever it may be. But, but what I'm pointing out, my social media has noticed that I like this stuff. So now most mornings when I come into work, I'll allow myself five or ten minutes of enjoying some uh, footage of people tossing pancakes and then hitting themselves in the face with a frying pan by accident and that kind of thing. I don't know, it appeals to my sense of the slapstick. But this text here really stopped me in my tracks. James, it's simple. When it becomes addictive, it's simply when the algorithm finds someone with an addictive personality. Lock and load. So there it is. If I had an addictive personality, and there have been times in my life when I thought that I did, then I would now be watching several hours a day of this stuff. Or maybe it's the wrong stuff. I just haven't found the stuff that I could get addicted to yet. And if if that ended up on my feed by accident, it would hook me in in a way that people hitting themselves in the face with frying pans hasn't. And by the way, I don't like, I like the ones that, you know, you can see them laughing afterwards. I don't like the ones that leave you with a 
sense of dread that something terrible has happened. I don't watch those, so they don't come up on my thing. But what if you loved the ones that leave you with a sense of dread that something terrible has happened? What if that was where you got your serotonin kick? And speaking of serotonin kicks, my thanks to Corpsey, who spares me the indignity of having to pat myself on the back for having understood this a little bit better than I thought I did. He writes, Bad news prompts serotonin and drives engagement more than good news, James. Who'd have thought it? If only there was a pithy phrase to describe this. Something like, It's easier to sell tickets to the ghost train than the speak your weight machine. God, wise words indeed, Corpsey. I wonder who came up with those. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.50 is the time. These notebooks are extraordinary. Um, and I, I share what I can if you follow me on Twitter or threads at Mr. James O'B. But it, it's I, there's probably a German word for it, that sense of being having your worst fears confirmed and it being a really horrible experience because Johnson was worse than we feared. Here's an extract from Sir Patrick Vallance's notebooks that I don't think has been picked up yet at the inquiry. Five hours of meetings with the PM. He came back from the Battle of Britain memorial service and was distressed by seeing everyone separated and in masks. Mad and spooky, we have got to end it, he said. He started challenging the numbers and questioning whether they really translate into deaths. He says it's not exponential, etc., etc. He looked broken, head in hands a lot. Is it because, this is in quotes from Boris Johnson, according to Patrick Valance, is it because of the great libertarian nation we are that it spreads so much? More quotes, maybe we are licked as a species. More quotes, we are too bleep to get our act together. We, back to Valens, we went round in circles and then the famous whiteboard emerges. We discussed package A, which was mild in measures, and package C, which was a full lockdown, and when and how to do a circuit breaker. Eventually we agreed to sort of a, a sort of circuit breaker and some stricter measures, but the PM kept clutching at straws. And then another bit that Adam Bienkov is, is sharing, if you follow him on Twitter, where the, the frustration at him simply not understanding things is... Quite extraordinary for someone that Nadine Doris thinks is very clever. Um, Claire Gardner talked PM through the graphs. It's difficult. He asks questions like, which line is the dark red one? Is he colour blind? And then, so you think positivity has gone up overnight? Oh, oh, then, oh God, bloody hell. But it is all the same stuff he was shown six hours ago. Uh, on the 22nd of July 2020, the Prime Minister struggled with the whole concept of doubling times. He just couldn't get it. And remember, miraculously, throughout this period, according to Jacob Rees-Mogg and Nadine Dorries, he was getting all the big calls right. What a relief. <sighs> I, I, I'm almost mildly relieved that he was thinking with his gut at one of the points that Charlotte Lynch referred to a moment ago, because, of course, he spent most of his life thinking with a very different part of his body, which might have been even more problematic for the nation. Let's go back to Belfast. Christopher is there to steer us back to the conversation about... Um, Addiction, really. Addiction and, and technology, social media and the whole shebang. Christopher, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi, James. I just wanted to say the you were saying earlier on about how, um, where and when yes. does it become addiction? And I just think that that's probably slightly the wrong way around to approach the issue. Because I think the issue is probably more like COVID in the sense that we don't know how addictive these technologies actually are. And we don't know how, uh, how much of a detrimental impact they actually have on people because we haven't got the definitive research to kind of say about those kind of things. And so if, really we've learned, issues... if we've learned anything from the last 50 years, even if the tech companies had the definitive research, then just like the sort of pharmaceutical companies and the tobacco companies, the last thing they'd be doing is making it public. Oh, no, no, exactly, exactly. And that's where I think that safety first approach is actually the, you know, the healthy approach. But what would that look like? Actually... I don't know. I no, well, don't I don't know. think it's feasible. You can't just stop it all can you i mean oh, no no exactly yep i don't know how hard it would be to have much 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 more robust age verification things in place but then children would find ways around them by tea time wouldn't they no no, no exactly but i just think that, that it's you know i work as an historian and um, work in research in that sense and the only you know like the only definitive thing you can say about you know like um health and safety in the past 200 years mm. is that private companies don't regulate themselves no that's it isn't it that's, that's the it. only thing about it and that's where i think the regulation is the kind of key um, thing about it because just like you said those companies have an incentive not to tell us how bad the and we've um, still technology got, is we've still we've still got people like Reese Mogg running around insisting that we need to deregulate we need less regulation when anybody with their head screwed on is going to look at the state of the world at the moment and think you know what we probably need a little bit more 
No, no, exactly. And that, that's where I think the regulation is. And as I said, working as an historian, yeah. that's the only um, like definitive thing we can really say is that they don't regulate themselves. No, and they and never so will. There needs to be a financial imperative or, a, exactly, cr- or a criminal imperative. They need to be fearful of proper punishment in the event of not properly regulating themselves. Otherwise, they'll end up putting substandard cladding on the side of, sky, on the side of tower blocks. To, um, to pluck an example from our recent history. Thank you, Christopher. 12.55 is the time. It's a strange old business, this. Uh, Sustama is in Watford. Sustama, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, I just wanted to join this conversation because I'm coming at it from a um, Buddhist perspective, and it's um, one where it's an understanding of how the mind works. Yes. And so I'll just um, keep it very simple. But um, so <laughs> Are you calling me stupid? Are you calling me no, stupid? <laughs> no, not at all. No, probably um, just but, as well, actually, Sustana. <laughs> probably just as well. Okay, so um, there's three levels of escape. And so the first one is when we experience suffering, so existential or psychological, not getting what we want or getting what we don't want, we automatically seek escape from that. And the easiest form of escape is um, sensory pleasure or pain. And before it used to be just drinking, smoking, sex. Now it includes social media. And that's not a problem. That's normal. Um, When it becomes a problem is when we start to identify with the habit of looking at certain material or doing the activities. So, for example, with um, smoker, we identify as being a smoker. And if if it starts to feed into our core beliefs, that's when it starts to become problematic because then we're almost creating a prison for ourselves where we um, know what gives us pleasure and we know it will help us escape from our, say, um, difficulties or challenges that we face or Mm. just um, feelings. And then we start to look out for the thing to reinforce our particular identity that we now created. And so you take a young person who has low self-esteem issues and they, you know, they find you know, in a way, they find relief when they meet other people who also feel the same as they do. But then the algorithm is set up to then feed them more and they can get lost along the way. And then when that starts to happen, then it's very difficult to break out of that. Because it's belief. become who you think you are. That's right. And all they want to do is reinforce that oh, they're right about who they think they are. That's absolutely that's right. heartbreaking. And then the third level of escape yes. is seeking oblivion when all of a sudden we experience something that has has nothing to do with our habit problem um it has something to do with you know getting sick or someone dying or ourselves being say um diagnosed with something terminal yes. and then the form of escape that used to give us escape from that suffering no longer is giving us that relief but in fact creating more pain because it's not helping us anymore then we want to destroy who we think we are. Oh um, my days. That one what's what, what's your background, Sistana? What's your field of expertise? How, how do you know all this stuff? So I'm a Buddhist priest and I, I, I specialise in Buddhist psychology. That's absolutely fascinating. Thank you. We'll t- I hope we can talk again. I, 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 I just... You, well, I don't know what the equivalent would be online, but if, if this was an algorithm, then you've just completely activated mine. <laughs> Well, great. Thanks. But, no, thank um, you. I have to go. I have to crack on. The show has come to an end. Sheila is itching to get going. And I just want to read out something from Carl quickly in Liverpool. It goes, can you see your unconscious bias? Your popularity is supported by these viral videos and platforms. I'm a big fan of yours, but I just want to keep you honest. No, mate, Carl, if you get addicted to my viral uh, content, then you just get more and more informed about things. So there's no escapism. You see, I'm not I'm not even being funny now. Stan is talking about escapism. My viral content does the exact opposite. It gives people detailed information and evidence about what's actually going on around them. So it's the polar opposite of the problem that you describe. But thanks for keeping an eye out for me. Uh, nonetheless, it is just coming up to one o'clock. That's it from me for another day. Should we do it all again tomorrow morning from 10? I, I, I will if you do. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back to the whole show podcast on Global Player. Pause, rewind and all the rest of it. Uh, download it free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Tom Swarbrick will be with you at four. But now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. James O'Brien on LBC.